What's up guys, Hong Nguyen, OG Fitness. Welcome to the channel. Guys, I have a surprise for you. So this one, I just want to preface this, uh, this video because this is a podcast that I did with uh, Ramsey Dewey. So uh, I reached out to him and uh, yeah, we, we did a podcast together. So it's his podcast number, I'm not too sure what, and I'll ju I'm just gonna call this one podcast number one for me. Um, and for those of you guys who don't know Ramsey Dewey, you should definitely check him out. I'm gonna put a link below to his uh, YouTube channel. Now he's a um, much more popular YouTuber than I am. Uh, he's, in, he's an MMA coach, he's in Shanghai, China, which is pretty crazy. And yeah, he has a lot of, lot of great content on his channel. And honestly, I love the guy. We spoke for four friggin' hours. That's a long ass time. And uh, I was surprised because usually podcasts, they only last about like, you know, anywhere between an hour to three kind of thing. You know, and three is like even stretching it. So I'm, I'm actually really happy that he um, <clears throat> enjoyed our conversation enough and it was flowing enough for us to um, continue talking for that long. And this one, I know it's four hours, guys. I'm gonna cut it up for you guys and make little clips. But for now, this is the full podcast and we touch on all kinds of subjects. So we touch on how to, uh, if you wanna become an MMA fighter, what's the best way to go about it, right? Um, you know, gym, how you should, um, what, what you should look out for in terms of cleanliness. Uh, we talk about uh, Tai Chi, longevity, um, you know, fighting, self-defense, eye gouging, kicking people in the nuts, how to go about that, judo, uh, BJJ, and all kinds of uh, fun stuff. And of course, we go off on tangents also. So it's, uh, it, it was great. I had a really great experience and I'm like, man, I should do this more often. So this is my first time. So I'm really thankful to Ramsey Dewey for, uh, you know, inviting me onto his podcast like that. Um, and yeah, I'm definitely going to stay in touch with him and we're going to eventually do some more. Uh, and I'm probably gonna go to China and train one day. Like I'm just waiting for the world to open up and uh, for, for things to, um, situation to change and to get better. And after that, yeah, once I get that money, I mean, I'm all about training and traveling and providing uh, some amazing content for you guys and, you know, have this community here to, uh, uh, you know, to, well, <clears throat> support me in my journey and at the same time for you guys to see what I'm doing and I'm going to provide as much help and value and advice and all that uh, as I can as we go about all this. So that's it, guys. Uh, enjoy the video. I know it's long, but obviously you could, you could two exit, okay? You can uh, watch it in chunks. You could wait for the clips. Uh, let me know uh, down below what you guys think. I'm sure there's things I could improve on first time. So uh, I'm really excited about this. So that's the announcement. And it'll be a different because instead of always me talking to you guys in front of the camera, you guys are gonna see me talking to other people. And then when the time comes, you guys are gonna see me on the mats, you know, moving around, doing other stuff, uh, competing. And yeah, man, it's gonna be good. So that's it, guys. Love you. Peace. froze there. All right, the recording has started. Let everyone know they are being recorded. I need to say that according to law or something. I don't know. Or There's common decency. <laughs> there, there actually are laws in China. Yeah. Well, I heard over there, you could, you could run over fools and, and uh, as long as you, you make sure you're, you're dead, you're, you're okay, right? <laughs> oh man, they, they actually started cracking down on that. Um, so you you probably heard about like um what what a what do they call it outside of China the um social credit systems like like a lot of people say social credit system but it, it's not one thing it's it's like multiple uh, separate independent agencies that um, keep track of various things for example traffic laws um, you know in America for example they've got um, the Department of Motor Vehicles, they, they keep track of, um, you know, what you do on the road. So for a very long time in China, yeah, yeah you were exactly right. If, if you had a traffic accident, it was cheaper to pay the fine for killing somebody on the road as opposed to paying their medical bills for the rest of their life if they were crippled. And so I, I had actually seen this before. I had actually seen people get run over and then the person would 
stop, back up, run them over again to make sure they were dead and go on. And th this comes off as shocking to a lot of Westerners who come from these countries with car culture, like, uh, you know, America, where, you know, cars have been the norm, traffic laws have been the norm for a very long time. In China, however, it's, um, cars are a fairly new thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's really just this, this modern generation that has had access to uh, motor vehicles in large numbers. So um, what, what this particular social credit uh, system that follows um, traffic laws does is rewards people for good behavior on the road, for example. It rewards them for stopping for pedestrians. And... That, that might seem like a given, like, well, of course you're supposed to stop for pedestrians. Well, yeah, in America, people know that. They've been doing it for generations. In China, it's a fairly new thing. Um, because when I got here, the, the rules of the road went like this. Basically, if, if your vehicle was bigger and more threatening, you had the right of way. And so if you were a pedestrian, you had to play a live-action game of Frogger, you know, that old 1980s video game to jump across the road and hope you didn't get squished. And now people will actually stop to you. They'll, they'll stop for you and let you cross at a crosswalk or a stoplight. They won't try to, you know, murder you on the way. So progress. Yes, there, there are laws in China now. Okay, okay. But, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not too surprised in the sense that, I mean, there's a lot of people in China. Yes. You know, and, and things evolve pretty quick. You know, like, like you said before, maybe there wasn't a lot of cars. Now everybody has cars. And then, like, you, you know, it takes more time to to, um, uh, you know, re-educate re and get people on the same page, so to speak, to do the same thing, to function in yeah. society, because there's just so many people. So, you know, uh, I, I don't judge them for that at all. It's, it's just, you know, it's just funny that they used to just run over people and yeah, <laughs> because it was I mean, cheaper. It was not an uncommon thing, man. It was not an uncommon thing at all. But yeah, but, it's, you know, it's, it's absolutely staggering. I, I, it's one thing to say 1.4 billion people, like people think they know what that means, but to actually um, understand how many 1.4 billion people is, it's, uh, it is, it's staggering. Like the, the first time I uh, stepped on a subway, like a, a metro train in Shanghai, it was, it was mind blowing to me. It was a sea of humans as far as the eye could see, just packed in. I was like, it, it made me claustrophobic. I, I grew up in a very small town, a, a town with like a thousand people and 20,000 cows. And seeing <laughs> way more people than that, including the cows, just crammed into a subway car, that was a little overwhelming. And everyone around me is just like, eh, this is normal. I was like, this isn't normal. This is weird. Ah! You know, it was... Uh, that was one of the most unnerving experiences of my, of my life, to be honest. But I'm so used to it now that uh, going to a place with wide open spaces and low populations, it's, uh, it's like, wow, this is, this is nice. This is different. This is ooh, peaceful. <laughs> how, how long have you been in China now? I've been here for 12 years. Man, I forgot to introduce you. Um, so welcome to the Ramsey Dewey podcast. I forget what number we're on 20 something, 30 something, 30 something, I think. Uh, we have our guest today, Hong Nguyen from OG Fitness. Go check out his channel, please. It's an excellent channel, especially for gentlemen over the age of 40 who are interested in training. And that's something I wanted to talk to you about. We're both over 40 and a lot of people are shocked when they find out how, how old I am because a lot of people think, I'm like uh, in my 20s or early 30s or something like that because they conflate fitness with age. Like if you are healthy, they think you're young. And if you're not healthy, they think you're old. Do you, do you ever run into this, this issue yourself? Uh, you, mean, um, you mean when people, when I tell people my age and they're, yes. they're surprised? Oh, yeah. yeah. All the time. All the time. Like when, when people find out I'm 42, they're like, no way. You know, you're kidding me. Get out of here. Blah, 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 blah. Some of them curse a little bit and they think I'm lying. They're like, show me your ID and stuff of like that. I'm like, then they're like, oh, it's because you're Asian. I'm like, well, maybe that's a small part of it. Like there is a genetic component to it, but I don't believe so. I believe that I just have a baby face. 
I don't have like a rough and tumble type of face, a square jaw. I don't got a beard. I can't grow one for my life. I tried. <laughs> Forget about it. So, so I look like a kid to begin with. And on top of that, like I've, I've been working out pretty much my whole life, except for that little, uh, between 20 and 30, I was, I was getting into a lot of trouble. So I, I mm. that kind of fell off. That kind of was on the back burner at that time. But, um, since I was born up until the age of 20, and then after that, from 30 up until now, uh, I've, been, I've been working out, man. I've been working out hard, you know? Yeah. And it's because I enjoy it. So, so I think a lot of, a lot of it I attribute to, um, you know, staying in shape, being healthy, working out, and, and yeah, that's it. That's, that's, a, that's a big part of it, you know? Yeah, man, everybody wants a magic pill like, um... People have accused me of uh, taking performance enhancing drugs, which I think is hilarious because um... I think that would actually age you faster. Yeah, you to... yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? Because essentially you're creating uh, hormone imbalances in, in your body. Like I, I run into a lot of younger guys who, you know, that first of all, they assume every everybody in the professional fight game is on steroids, which is just it's it's just patently absurd. It's, it's not true. Everybody stronger than you is on steroids, is what everybody on the internet seems to say or think. But um, what a lot of people don't seem to realize is that the, the peak levels of human strength are achievable between the ages of 35 and 50 in adult human males. And this is shocking to most people because they are so used to seeing people between the ages of 35 and 50 giving up on life, being physically unfit, having pot bellies, beer guts, whatever you want to call them, and just not participating in the world of physical culture. You know, that's that's a surprise to me because I thought that that like uh, as a male, your your physical peak is around 35. That was uh, that was from what I gathered. And uh, but, um, you know, I think that you're you're much more well read than I am. Right. And you have a lot more experience in martial arts. So I'm I'm actually happy to hear that 35 to 50 so i'm still like oh yeah yeah you know you know like uh, i don't know if you you notice but like my whole thing is that i'm going for a world title i want to become a world champion in judo okay. obviously in my in my age category in my division right so it's going to be master yeah. uh, i don't know 50 masters 10 whatever you know but okay. so does judo have like the same age categories as brazilian jiu jitsu like uh Masters is over 30, then Masters, um, I think uh, 40 to 45 is like Masters 3 and so on. And then Masters 7 is like 50 to 60 or something like that. I think so. I believe so. I'm not sure 100%, but Masters does start at 30 years old. That's And then okay. at 35, I think it's Masters 2. And then after that, I think 40, it's Masters 3. And then, you know, but you could compete like there, there's like, I've seen 80, 90 year olds like on the internet competing in judo. So, I mean, you know, it's, uh, you could compete as long as you want and, and nothing, nothing stops you from like competing, uh, with, with the 20 year olds. Yeah. If, if you I wanted that, to, I know that shocks a lot of people because so many people, especially in the West have not met a healthy 80 year old man before. Like I, I, I told a story on my channel that just raised a lot of eyebrows and, People are like, I don't believe it. About a time I met a uh, a master of tai chi, who was really physically fit, like the guy could do backflips and he could do all kinds of gymnastic movements and and hold his leg up over his head doing the splits. And I sparred with him, and he actually beat me. He he managed to throw me on the ground and catch me with submissions and things like this. And people are like, No way, that's impossible. Because I think what they're imagining is some dude in a nursing home hooked up to an oxygen tank or a you know, or a dialysis machine or something like that, because they've never met a physically fit older person before. Now, in in China, it's it's a very different world because older people tend to stay active. They, they don't really have nursing homes here. It's, it's not a thing. It's not part of the culture. And so old people are always out and about doing something. Generally in the morning, they're, they're doing Tai Chi or ballroom dance or just going on a walk or some sort of physical exercise. And they do this in the morning, they do it in the evening, and you always see the old people doing this. It's part of their culture. But it's, um, it's part of the culture that's been lost on the younger generation. You don't see young kids doing that. Of course, they're, they're in school or they're playing video games or whatever. 
but uh, I imagine the next few generations in China, people are going to be telling these these legends about healthy old people that what existed once upon a time, and people will be like, "No way, no way!" There were old people that could go for a walk in the park by themselves. Impossible. I don't know. But we have some really screwy ideas about about age. This idea that we have to essentially become decrepit as as we get older. So. What would yeah. you say are are um, some of the biggest challenges that that you uh, come across with? Because you you do uh, online training with with uh, people, especially like uh, like people over forty, right? Yeah, yeah. I I train a lot of people over forty, uh, cool. but I do have like some 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 younger clientele, like people who are in their um, uh, in their thirties. Okay. You know, so like it, it's anywhere between thirty till fifty, my clientele. Yeah, project, you know, and uh, I like to like I like to train men uh, mostly. That's 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 who I like to uh, to deal with the most. But I'm not um, I'm not against training women either. Um, I just find that women tend to be a little bit more emotional, so I got to be a little bit nicer. <laughs> yeah. Right. Whereas men, I could just be a little bit harder on them when I need oh, to yeah. be. You know, it, I, it's, like I'm still it's always absolutely trying. true. It's absolutely right. true, man. I, I learned this trying to train my wife because my wife, at first, she was like, uh, "You know, you, you're you're a you're a trainer, you're a fitness professional. Um, be my personal trainer." I was like, "All right, do this, do that, whatever." And she started getting mad at me. I'm like, "What's wrong?" And she's like, "I don't want you to train me anymore. You're 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 too you're too mean, basically." I was <laughs> like, "Man." Ye you can't train women the same way as men most of the time because with with a guy you can say suck it up buttercup or drop and do me 50 or drop it drop and give me 50 what am i saying here um and and guys will just do it because they, they've got this competitive urge they don't want to look weak and and uh yeah it's a it's a different thing man yeah yeah so what was your question again regarding um training difficulties oh yeah regarding well, what kind of challenges have you run into um not so much training older guys, but uh, convincing, convincing older guys that they can train. Like, is this is this something that comes up? Uh, you know what? Like a lot of them, uh, when when they when they find out like how old I am, that's when they're like shocked. And then when I tell them also, hey, and I'm I'm also natural. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because the thing is my profile pic, right? My my like on, on IG and on Facebook, I'm there without with, without my shirt. Yeah, and I'm you got like, muscles and striations and yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, this so look I look people associate with youth. Hmm? You got this look people associate with with youth, right? Young and exactly. athletic. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So then, um, you know, when I tell them, hey, I'm I'm actually natural and I'm 42. Then they're shocked, you know, and then I, I, I explain to them, listen, it's, it's very possible for you to get into really good shape at your age right now, you know, like it's not, yeah. it's, not uh, it's not in the realm of um, impossible, of the impossible, so to speak, you know, it's just about doing certain things right and doing it long enough for it to work. That's it. Yeah. There's no magic here. Like I'm not trying to sell, and I tell them it always takes about, uh, when you ask me, well, how long is it going to take? I'm like, well, depends on on where you're at. But you know, give it about a year or two, and I'll I'll change you completely. But that's how long it's going to take. You know, uh, three months it's a start, but it ain't gonna you ain't gonna look like me. You, you don't necessarily need to look like me, but you know, I always preach at least 15% body fat. That's my opinion on it. I think at 15. You know, you're you're looking good uh, with clothes on, without your shirt on, and it's 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 healthy. Ten percent is not for everybody because it's going to depend on genetics, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and ten percent, I mean, some people are able to stay lean easier than others because of their their genes and how much muscle they have and all that. But fifteen is a nice nice balance. If you want to get to ten afterwards, we could work on that. But depending on where they're at, I like to get them down to fifteen, and then we'll we'll re like we'll reassess what they would like to do. If they want to take it further, just, further, just to see how 10% actually looks like, okay, but yeah. it's going to demand more sacrifice. It's going to take you more than what it took you to get to 15. Yeah. You know, so that, you know, and, and that's, that in my opinion is the truth. It takes a year or two to change somebody completely. 
depending on how much uh, how much body fat you need to lose, how much muscle uh, you want to build. But it's it's I'm a so process. Glad you brought you know? that up. So glad you brought that up. Just last night, I was speaking with my wife. One of her uh, coworkers um, posted this picture, this before and after picture of this radical eight week transformation, and. In both pictures, this dude's posing with his shirt off, and then the first one, he okay, he's doing this thing everybody does in these before and after pictures. And the, the original picture, the original picture, he's slouching, <laughs> looking sad, sticking his gut out, bad lighting. Um, in the second picture, he's got his chest shaved, all oiled up, flexing, looking confident, side lighting so you can see all the striations. I'm like, that dude's just flexing and posturing. And she's like, but, but, I'm like, you, you don't experience radical body transformations in eight weeks. You don't. There, it, there's no magic pill like that. I know everybody wants to do that, but it's, um, it's a very popular way to sell fitness programs on the internet. It's a very popular way to get people excited, to make them think, if you invest a minimum of time, this tiny little amount of effort will give, give you this massive result. And it's just simply not true. Just like you're saying, it, it takes some time. It takes a serious investment of time. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, and 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 that's the thing, right? Because there's a lot of um, well, people just trying to sell you, uh, you know, their program or some kind of supplements, you know, and and they're full of it, unfortunately, you know, and they're just out there to get your money. But me, I'm like, no, it's gonna take you about a year. Uh, like it depends on where they're at. If they only have like ten pounds to lose, then obviously it's not gonna take a year. But if they want to build muscle on top of that, well, first of all, it's gonna depend on genetics. Second of all, it's going to depend on like how hard you train. And yeah. even then, like it depends on like um, at what uh, what stage you're at in your um, in your uh, so-called bodybuilding evolution, right? Because when if you're a newbie, you could build more muscle quickly the first year, you know, newbie gains, right? But yeah. if it's been like if it's been a couple of years you've been training, uh, you know, more over let's say four or five years now, and uh, you're older now too. Like that has an impact. So, you know, there's uh, we'll have to kind of work out hard and see what happens kind of thing, you know, it, like you can't just build muscle, like put on 10 pounds of muscle in, in three months. There's a lot of people yeah. who claim that and it's, it's, uh, it, it's crazy. It's nonsense. It's like, even with steroids, I think 10 pounds in three months. No, nah, mm. that's no, nah, that's, that's too much. That's too much. That's impossible. Yeah. That's the, the, the newbie gains we're talking about. This is an interesting concept to me because uh, you, like a person who doesn't train athletically, a person who doesn't lift, for example, when, when they learn correct lifting technique, like even if they don't put on any muscle, when they learn how to fix their posture and lift correctly, for example, doing the deadlift correctly, doing the squat correctly, it is alarming how their strength improves dramatically just from proper technique and because essentially you're going from i can't even lift a bar to look i can pull up actual weights now this is amazing right what was i going to say let's let's talk about judo for a minute i feel like we're going all over the place but you, you <laughs> practice judo i know you you made a you made a video about um you you used to practice brazilian jiu-jitsu but you made a pretty concrete switch to to judo specifically um why that change? Oh man, yeah. Okay, so um, at thirty years old, that's when I started judo. Uh, sorry, jujitsu. Yeah. And uh, so I did jujitsu for for six years, and then from there, what happened was that I lost my job. Mm. And and at that time, I lost my job, and I'm like, I just bought a, I just bought a condo, and uh, I was lucky that the it actually passed, like the bank. I got the loan before the bank found out that I lost my job because yeah. I applied uh, a little bit uh, ahead of time. So then I lost my job. I'm like, man, I can't afford BJJ anymore. You know, I gotta start like I gotta I gotta tighten up my belt and 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 you know like um, be yeah. more careful with my expenses. So then. But at my BJJ club, what happened was that um, <clears throat> I had a, a, a teammate who was, uh, who was a judoka. And he was giving classes. He was, he was giving classes. He was teaching at another at a judo club. So he told me, he kind of recruited me because he saw that, um, <clears throat> well, I figured, 
what I'm trying to get at is that he, we trained together, so he kind of knew like uh, how I was in terms of physical skill and all that. And he's like, why don't you come and try judo? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to, man. But, you know, like I, I just lost my job. I don't have any money. So he's like, hey, anyways, listen, I, I, give, uh, I give the classes there, so you don't need to pay. Just come. And that's how I got into judo. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome! So, that's so that was that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and because because he wanted me, like he he saw he saw something in me, and he said, "You'd be, you know, you'd be great at judo. Why don't you come train?" And I'm like, "Well, I can't. I don't have money." He said, "Well, listen, it's uh, just come and train, and you'll pay when you get a job or whatever, you know." And uh, and and that that's how it started. So I started judo at 36. Huh. That, that that's interesting because I think a lot of people. A lot of people tend to think of um, judo as a much more violent, high-risk type of sport than Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and I'm not sure it actually is. And I think it's, I think it's just because people are afraid of falling, you know, the, the natural fear of falling. So many Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools, for example, say, oh, we can't start on the feet because takedowns are too dangerous, which I think is ridiculous because every jiu-jitsu tournament starts on the feet, even if you are a guard puller. Even if that's your whole game plan, you need to learn how to do that starting from the feet because that's how tournaments start. Because if you if you don't even have the experience of pulling guard against a standing opponent, you're going to have a really hard time getting into the position you want in, a, in an actual competition. But that being said, you know, in judo, it's no secret you get tossed on the ground a lot, right? You need to know how to break fall and there are potential risks involved. But... Um, in your experience, which do you think is more dangerous, judo or Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Oh, man. <laughs> 100% judo. Okay. Usually, usually people transition from judo to BJJ as they get older yeah. because it's safer, right? Because you're on the ground, and so you, there's nowhere for you to fall, really. Like, you could, get it, you could still get injured, of course, but I mean... You're on the ground. What's gonna happen? What's the worst that could happen? Like as long as you tap fast and you're properly warmed up, and you know you don't you don't uh, you don't let the person um, crank on the uh, on the submission, then you, technically you should be okay. Um, but definitely judo, because judo um, as you get older, like you know a lot of, a lot of kids when they start judo, well they're kids, so they don't have a long way to go to fall down. And of course, kids are light also. They weigh nothing. So they could land on their head and they'll still be kind of okay because they're still malleable. They're still growing. Uh, you still have to be careful, of course. But, you know, and kids yeah. have no fear. They, they don't have that sense of, uh, you know, it's, it's not a big deal for them to run around and fall. Um, whereas for an adult, like, man, falling, if, if, you don't know, if you don't learn how to break fall properly, then, uh, yeah, you could get into trouble. And then from there, it's just that, in judo, there's, it's the knees and the shoulders. Mm -hmm. they, they get entangled a lot while you're standing yeah. up. And also in judo, it's it's because if you don't um, if you don't know how to accept the fall, and usually that's the problem with a lot of beginners is that they'll come in and they'll they'll, they'll fight, they'll resist, and then if you throw them, you pit them against another beginner, and then one beginner will entangle his legs into, onto the other. And he'll try to force it. He'll try to force the, you know, the throw, the takedown. And yeah. the other one, who doesn't have enough experience to understand that, you essentially, in that position, your checkmate, you should just accept the fall. They resist. And then their foot gets stuck on the ground where they're, while their body gets twist. And there you go. The knees go. And then over time, let's say you get thrown. And on top of that, you, do, you make the mistake of sticking your arm out or even... Uh, like this, or even just trying to post it with your forearm, your elbow, yeah. your shoulders are going to go. And people are constantly attacking uh, on uh, either, for the most part, most people are right-handed. They attack on the right side, so they're going to attack on your right arm. And your right arm gets pulled, like, constantly while you're practicing. And if you're right-handed, your right hand is forward, and so is your right leg. So it creates a big imbalance in your body, too. Like, so all the musculature of your body is like pulled to the right. That's what happened to me. So now I got lower back issues. Um, and uh, I got deviation of the spine towards the right. This shoulder here is all kind of, is messed up. And I got, I got ankle, uh, I got my right ankle is, it lost its mobility. Because one thing you don't, 
if you don't learning how to fall break falling is, is a little bit complicated in the sense that there's a lot of little details that if you're not taught correctly you could get injured so me for example when i was uh falling i was being thrown and you get thrown a lot in judo you know yeah. that's 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 part of the learning process it's like um in jiu-jitsu you, you tap out a lot right mm -hmm. and in judo you, you get thrown a lot so i was getting thrown a lot and the thing is when you land um uh, you have to keep this is a thing you have to keep your your foot flexed you know i, mm. I, I don't I'm not flexible enough to pull up my foot and show you but you gotta <laughs> if this was my foot you would have to keep it flexed hold on case, i think yeah. i am okay here's a foot there's a flex foot there's a pointy there foot there's a there relaxed foot flexed what is relaxed okay there you go there you go so you got you got to keep it flexed because a lot of times what's going to happen is that your heels your heel is going to smash into smash into the ground you know when you land so if you don't do that and you, you land enough on that on on your heel okay and your foot is not flexed it's going to like give such a shock to your ankle that it's going to displace it and it's going to cause like um injury to your ankle and then you might just think it's a sprained ankle, but you, you know, you do that enough times over a span of like, you know, four years, let's say five years, then all of a sudden that ankle that keeps on getting a beating, well, loses, loses its uh, mobility. So that's what happened to my ankle. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this judo is the best endorsement for judo I've ever heard, man. <laughs> <laughs> the best what? The best endorsement for judo I've ever heard, man. Oh yeah, it's listen. It's a man sport, man. You know, <laughs> it's 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 a ride. Like you, you get like you know. That's why I don't I don't suggest it to everybody. Like I talk about it in my videos, but I'm like, man, yeah. judo, you can get busted up. So here are the ways that I found to you know survive. And if I had to do it again, this this is what I would suggest you to do. And um, what else is bad in judo? Um, Oh, your knees. Yeah, your knees. They get yeah. entangled all the time, especially with beginners. Actually, I, I say I've that, but it's a funny a thing. It was actually it was actually a, a black belt that busted my knee like the first uh, the first month I started judo. He busted up my knee because he felt threatened in the, in Randori. And I think this black belt wasn't somebody who um, who's like a high level competitor or anything mm -hmm. like that. You know, he yes, he did earn his black belt, but he's not like the best fighter, so to speak. And he felt threatened by me because he saw he, he you know, you saw that I was, I was, I was doing okay for myself. And, yeah. uh, yeah. So our legs got entangled and he busted up my knee. And actually there was a second time it happened on the other knee and it was another black belt. This guy was actually a good fighter. He was on the national team and he busted up my knee cause he's just missed. He's just crazy. You know, <laughs> uh, not, not all judo players are created equal, man. This is, well, this is something I've learned over the years. I've trained with a lot of uh, judoka, like in China, a, a huge percentage of the people who go into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu come from a Judo background because Judo is a fairly popular sport in China, whereas Jiu-Jitsu is a fairly new one. But there, there is a lot of, there are, are a lot of people leaking over from, from Judo into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And man, there is such a, such a broad spectrum of skill levels. So when somebody says, I'm a black belt in Judo, I don't know what that means, to be honest, because I've met black belts who are just absolute killers in almost all aspects of grappling. And then I've met black belts who are, you know, pretty good at throwing on the floor and, and nothing else. And you guys who are black belts who are pushovers and guys who are black belts who are world beaters. Like in, in your experience, have you seen this sort of diversity of skill level in, in judo amongst black belts? Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, like um, <clears throat> because there, there, there's, um, I mean, there, there's some black belts that are more, uh, what do you call it? They're there for it's more recreational. Yeah. You know, like they they, they, they enjoy the art. They do the katas. You know, um, they didn't really uh, like to compete, so they got their black belt. Um, you know, because the way you get your black belt here, right in uh, in Canada. Is that once you get your brown belt, then after that you have to go pass. Uh, you have to accumulate 120 points in competition, right? And you have to pass the exam in front of like a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, in front of the federation. You know, some some judges okay. where they, they call out some techniques and you have to perform a kata. And um, right, so it's not something that, that your uh, instructor can give to you in uh, in the gym. 
Exactly, exactly. And now the thing is, for the 120 points, you could either accumulate it through competition, which is the fastest way, or, okay, like you could, uh, uh, if you don't want to compete, well, then it's going to take you, it could take you three to five years mm. to, get that, to get that black belt because you need those points. If you don't have those points, you're not getting your black belt. If you're a competitor, then you're going to get it relatively fast. You know, you just do, uh, uh, you, do all, you do a couple of, you do, you do one season of competition and you could get your, you could get, you could accumulate enough points. And then from there so you do your exam. You get, you get points your points without competition? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Every, every year that you, um, you pay your fees to the Judo Federation, uh, when you get your brown belt, you get 10 points. Okay, so basically, if, if you just keep showing up, eventually you'll get that belt, right? Yeah, and if you want a ref, like if you want a ref, you can get maybe 10 points too for each okay. competition that you ref, I think. And then if you, uh, if you do seminars, I think you can, you, can get, uh, um, you can get 10 points too for seminar. So hmm. you would have to do quite a bit of uh, seminars, quite a bit of refing. And then on top of that, every year you, you, you pay your registration fees for judo, so you would get your 10 points. So it would take, you could get your black belt, it, was, it would just take you a lot longer, that's all. Yeah. Now, combining the two previous topics, we were talking about older guys training and we're talking about judo now. Now, judo has a really interesting history of older guys training. For example, um, w w one of the most famous examples, Mifune, you know, one of the students of Jigoro Kano, you can see videos of him on YouTube at age 70 and age 80, uh, doing Rondori with, with his students. And it's, it's an interesting video because I can see like, you know, some of them, obviously they're respecting the fact, the fact that he's an older gentleman. They're respecting the fact that he's, you know, he's the, uh, the honorable sensei or whatever it is. But um, some of these guys, I can see they're also legitimately trying to toss this dude on the ground. And have you seen these videos of Mifune doing Rondori? Yeah, 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 I have, I have. And they're so interesting because, because of the way he moves, it's, it's very, very different from the way that most, most people approach judo. Because, you know, when, when I would describe it as like a floating quality, he tries, he, you know, they grab the lapels, he grabs under the triceps on, on the gi and just sort of floats with them. And it's it's very graceful and it's it's very interesting. It is um, an economy of motion that is sorely lacking in most people. Have um, I don't know how I want to formulate this question, but have you seen anything like that in real life? Hmm. I've seen I've seen one guy at my first judo club. This guy looks like. I hope he's not going to watch this. I don't think so because he doesn't have internet or Facebook or, or cell phones for that matter because he's, he's kind of yeah. weird that way. But he's a, he's a teacher and he has his black belt. This guy looks like nothing. You look at him like puny, you know? And then when he fights, okay, and uh, when he fights though, so we go Hajime and then, you know, I'm like coming at him like this with my hands up and he just stands there with his arms to the side. Yeah. Soon as I grab him, he just waits for me to. Then he can, you know, I grab him. Then after that, he he'll he'll grab me back. But then it's all about timing. His judo mm. is all about timing. But he's so good at it. He's 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 at such a level that, yeah, he, he takes me down like this, and he's he's hardly using any strength. Hardly using any, any strength at all. It was really impressive. He was in his um his mid thirties, I believe. Okay. And 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 I'm physically bigger and stronger than him and yeah he he beat me like like nothing like nothing it was it was and I, I asked my judo coach my my competition judo coach at that time this was at the first club I asked him hey what's with this guy I can't you know like he has this funny way of doing things and he just beats my ass all the time and he's like oh he's a timing guy he's a timing judo you know his judo is all about timing all about like pre precision technique timing that's what it's about and he's developed it at a very like he's an amazing judoka so i'm like okay so how do you beat him oh he's like oh easy i overpower him <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm like well wh wh what do you mean by overpowering well he's like listen it's not complicated you know like my judo is 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 
is very um, competition oriented. And the, the way you beat a guy like that is that you grab, obviously, like in judo, it's all about the grips, right? So you grab the sleeve, you put that down, you bring that big, big uh, overhand right over his, uh, on top of his, um, his back. And grab the, grab yeah, the and, of, the, and of the gi. Crush. Exactly, exactly. Like instead of grabbing the lapel, you grab over and you crush him. And my coach, my competition coach, had such power in this position here. He could hold you like this for like five minutes while you're wiggling around like, you know, like, ah, for dear life trying, but you won't get out of it. That's how strong he is, you know? He could probably like, you know, have a drink, you know, smoke a cigarette, and then come back here and raw, and you wouldn't be able to move. And then he would let it loose when he'd want to attack you. And that's how, that's how he defeated this uh, ultra technical, ultra precise, uh, with amazing timing judoka. But he crushed him with strength. Strength matters in judo. Strength and size, it matters. So what I'm getting at is that um, the Muho Mufume uh, video thing, I think that I believe he has amazing timing and he has amazing um, um, skills, right? His timing is good. His skill set is good. Like he has that... Uh, that, that, that tactical awareness, you know, he, he sees things coming. Uh, I, but, I mean, he was, what, what was he, like 80 years old in that video or 90? Okay. But, I think so I, two, I, he was like 70, the other 80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I still think that, um, so I think that, yeah, he, he probably is very high level. But at the same time, I think his students were giving him too much respect. And mm -hmm. they weren't. They weren't crushing him. They were giving him what he wanted, even though it was with force. But he, he, he's been doing this for so long that he could see it coming. You know, they, he was like his students were giving him the kumikatas. They were going 50-50 grip. So when you give a, a guy 50-50 grip, even though you try, you have 50-50 and then you go for your, uh, your technique, even if you go for it with speed and strength, I mean, it's, it's somewhat telegraphed, so to speak. And, and that's, that's yeah, a good and, point because there was no grip fighting. There was just like, okay, let's almost like an agreement. We're going to grab in this specific way. All right, ready, go. Exactly. Exactly. To, I want this lapel. No, you don't. Get that on. You know, no stripping the grips, none of that. Exactly. Exactly. So, in my opinion, like, uh, because the, the rule of thumb in judo is if you have 50 50 grips, like you have your grips on me, I have my grips on you then it's the man with the better judo that wins. But yeah. if I, even if, let's say, for example, your judo was better than mine's, but I get the dominant grip, right, like a two-on-one, so to speak, or, you know, uh, then, yeah, I'll, I'll, my chances of throwing you go, go way, 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 well, way up. So that's why I think that even though he probably is very, very skilled, very high level, I think it was... Um, it was more a, of a demonstration thing than anything else. Like his, his students were, yes, they were coming in to attack him with full force and speed. But I mean, he, they, it's, it's telegraphed because, you know, they, they both had 50-50 grips. And, you know, there's probably a certain level of respect there. They're not going to, and there was no grip fighting. So that doesn't make sense. If you watch any, any video, uh, a judo video, like uh, in the Olympics, you're gonna note, you'll notice they fight like hell for their grips. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's it's the first thing, man. Like you know, whoever wins that battle essentially is gonna throw the other person. So uh, it's uh, strength in martial arts, strength in combat sports. It's it should be obvious, and this is something I talk about on my channel constantly. Is how important strength training is for combat sports athletes. But it's, it's still, to this day, a very highly resisted topic. Like, Keenan Cornelius, he, you know, former, uh, you know, multiple-time world champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, famously said, uh, I, I might get this quote wrong, but I love it, it's, it's something along the lines of, the most important thing in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is lifting weights. The second most important thing in Brazilian jiu-jitsu is knowing jiu-jitsu. <laughs> and when people hear that, they, they hate it. They're like, no, but my, my professor told me it's about leverage and, and pressure and, and yeah, okay, sure. But when all other things are equal, 
right? Say you get on the mat in a competition and you're a black belt and you're competing with another black belt. Which black belt wins? Presumably they both know the same moves, the same techniques, the same strategies. Which one wins? The more athletic and the more aggressive one is the one that's going to win that one, right? So, and it's, I also talk about Bruce Lee on my channel a lot, and uh, a lot of people hate me for it because I, I, I like to um, dispel a lot of the stupid myths around the guy. I love Bruce Lee, and I hate the myths built up around him. One thing Bruce Lee does not get enough credit for by the Bruce Lee fanboys is the emphasis he put on strength training, especially in an era where people were telling combat sports athletes, don't pick up a weight. Like even the great Jack Dempsey, a man that I idolize as much as any, anyone, um, you know, in his book, Championship Fighting, which I love, and most, almost everything in that book is gospel truth about boxing. But for me, he tells, he tells you, don't lift weights. It'll make you slow and muscle bound. And when I read that, I was like, ah, well, that's a, he's a, a product of his time in that regard. But that was commonly believed, and it still is commonly believed among many people. I read this in, in the comments of my YouTube videos constantly. Don't, I, don't lift weights, it'll slow you down. Don't lift weights, it will make you too bulky. And I keep telling people, no, strength is the precedent for athletic performance. Strength is the precedent for all athletic performance. If you want functional flexibility that you can actually use, you, you also need to be strong. If you want to be fast, you also need to be strong. If you want these athletic attributes that make you a good fighter, you need to be strong first. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Because, you know, going back to what you were saying, um, King Cornelius, where he said the first thing is, you know, lifting weights. The second thing is knowing jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Well, you know, strength is strength and size and all that, it matters, right? And I think, so just to just to make, to to stay on that, for that, that point that, Keenan Cornelius uh, said, because I, I always say the same thing more or less, and that's, okay, you need to have skills, but you need to have the strength and conditioning to back up that skill. Because that skill alone, if you meet a person who is of equal skill to you, it's gonna be the stronger and faster one, and that's gonna win. You know, and of course, there's the whole mindset uh, behind it too, but the stronger guy's gonna win. Uh, both, if both skill sets uh, are, are Pretty much equal and and yeah it's, it's super important and i think where people get it wrong when they say that oh lifting is going to get you slow is because they're looking at bodybuilders yeah okay first off a bodybuilder takes steroids so he's above his genetic limits in terms of how much muscle he could pack on like because there's a limit to how much each person can pack on in a lifetime it ranges from 20 to 40 pounds of lean muscle mass in a lifetime Mm -hmm. That might not sound like a lot, but most people, when they gain muscle, you don't just gain muscle. You gain muscle. There's a little bit of fat in there. There's glycogen. There's water. You know. So I mean, you know, that's why when you when you hear people say stuff like, oh, uh, like uh, a before and after picture, this guy gained, uh, you know, like ten pounds of muscle in in in, in three months. No, he didn't. He might have gained one or two, and the rest is just fat, water, and glycogen. And if yeah. he took steroids, he might have gained three, you know, but the rest is still fat, water, and glycogen, you know, because when you're bulking up, like there's a, it's a physiological process of breaking down your muscle tissue and rebuilding it with protein. That, that shit takes time. You don't, Indeed. it doesn't happen like that. So with that said, if you're a bodybuilder, well, first of all, you're taking steroids, so you're above your genetic, genetic limit. So now, of course, it's going to hinder you. And bodybuilders aren't playing any sports. That is their sport. Their sport is just to pack on muscle. But if you're a natural athlete and you take uh, and, and you lift weights, you want as much possible as your genetics will allow because that's only going to make you stronger, faster, and more explosive and less injury prone. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to translate into performance. But how much of that, how much muscle can you actually put on? Well, it's, it's, it's genetics. Some people could put on that 40 pounds, so to speak, of lean muscle mass. Uh, in their lifetime, and some people only 20. So whatever, genetic, whatever, whatever it is that genetics that you have, you want to max it out. 
Yeah. It takes about 10 years to max it out. 10 years of consistent training and doing the right thing to really max it out. Most people never get close to maxing out their potential, you know? Uh, and, and that's, that's my take on it. Yeah. It's, it's funny. We say like only 20 pounds of muscle. And yet if, if you put like 20 pounds of meat on the table and looked at it, you'd be like, that's a lot of meat, man. That is a <laughs> lot. So. Yeah, man. I was looking at a picture of Thor Bjornsson posted on social media the other day. He went to some barbecue restaurant and they gave him like a, like a five pound stack of meat. And it was like this, this ungodly giant stack of, um, you know, pieces of cow and pig that were just, uh, I was like, that would not fit in a human stomach. Anyway, not a yeah. normal human. Maybe Thor could eat it, but that was a lot of food. Just five pounds of, of barbecue meat, man. Yeah, yeah, but he's a, he's a big man, right? So... Yeah. And, uh, like, I don't know, man. You ever watch those uh, Naughty or Not videos on, on, uh, on YouTube? I've, I've seen some of those. I mean, there, there are a bunch of different channels dedicated to, is this, is this guy natural or not? And, you know, I forget the dude's name, but this, this one guy, he's basically convinced that nobody is natural. And he's looking at guys who have a physique like me, and he's like, there's no way this guy can have a, a natural physique. You can see his abs. I'm like, it's not that hard to have <laughs> visible muscle striations. Like, that, that is an achievable thing for a human being to do, even in their 40s. It's, anyway. But, but, but how yeah. old are you exactly, Ramsey? Like, you're, you're 40... Uh... 42. 42? 42? Okay, we're, we're exactly the same age. We're, yeah. You know, I, I was, uh, my friend told me about that. My friend who uh, watches your, your, your channel too, and uh, is a big fan. By the way, I have a question uh, for you from him, which okay. I told him I was going to ask. But before I get to that, I just wanted to say that, that when he told me you were my age, I was like, wait a second. He looks, he looks really good. <laughs> and you do. You know why? You know why? Because the thing is, you're, you're also Caucasian. Hmm. And a lot of Caucasians, they, they seem to, 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 uh, to have crappy anti-aging genes. <laughs> For True, some reason, yeah. they, they wrinkle up fast, you know, and they, they just, mm -hmm. they, they shrivel up. Like, maybe it's just too much exposure to the sun. I don't know. But... I think a lot of it is lifestyle. You know, my yeah, wife has gotten yeah. really into skincare recently. And uh, one thing she started doing she never did before is wearing sunscreen every day. And that this is something Chinese women do all the time. And my wife used to make fun of them, like, oh, why are they wearing sunscreen all the time? This is silly. But then she noticed something is, uh, you know, Chinese women tend to look very youthful, even, even when they're old, even when they're like 80 and 90 years old. And she started thinking, maybe there's something to that. And so she starts researching skincare. And apparently, yeah, there, there is um, the sun ages the skin. But... Yeah, I think what it comes down to is a lot of people just have crappy lifestyles. Like, um, you know, clean living goes a long way. Staying hydrated. I, I don't drink alcohol. I don't do drugs. Mm. I, mm. I, uh, I don't even use caffeine. That shocks a lot of people. Like, what? You don't even have coffee or tea or anything like that? No, none of that. And, you know, simple, simple lifestyle choices. I eat whole foods. I don't eat garbage. I don't eat processed crap. And... I try to stick to a consistent sleeping schedule and it's, and above all else, I, I, here's the secret, man. I get out <laughs> there and I train, I get out there and train. And that's the magic pill. That is the magic pill, man. Okay. That okay, is as close to the fountain of youth as you're going to get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you train a lot, and at the same time, you do a lot of things right. Like you don't smoke, you don't drink, you you know, and you eat you eat pretty clean. And yeah, it, it shows. It shows. And I'm surprised because usually, like I, I I rarely meet a Caucasian 40, 42 year old, even if they work out and they're in shape, yeah. that that look as good as you do. You know, like facially, I'm looking at you, and you know, I'm like, you're not that much different from me. You know, in terms of youth youthfulness. Uh, mm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty, I was, I was like, man, he looks good, you know, like for, for, for a white guy who's my age, like he looks like, the, you're like, you'd be the equivalent of me, uh, you know, but, but white, which is. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, man. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, by the way, you you kind of uh, I found out in one of your videos that Bruce Lee had a stuntman, and I was yes. like, oh, yes, Yuen Wa, Yuen Wa. He was he was a he's a famous um, Hong Kong uh, movie stuntman. He performed in a bunch of movies, and in the movie Enter the Dragon, anytime you see Bruce Lee do a an acrobatic movement, there are a few movements like he does some round offs and then a then a flip over over a pole at the beginning of the movie after mm -hmm. that first fight scene and then um and there's that scene where he's fighting um i think it's bob wall and he does the backflip kick that's yeah, yeah. every time there's an athletic or um, an acrobatic movement an athletic movement anytime there's an acrobatic movement in a bruce lee movie it's you and wah and a lot of oh, people man. hate to hear this because they they want to you know believe bruce lee could do everything but you know he was a smart man he was a you know, he was smart enough to know his limitations. I mean, Bruce Lee spent most of his adult life working with a serious back injury. And he, yeah, he he understood he was not the larger than life superhero portrayed in the in the movies. And yes, he had he had that stunt double, Yuen Hua. Yeah, yeah, that kind of, you know, that kind of surprised me, you know, and, and for, it's it's been a long time now that I've been <clears throat> disillusioned. I mean, I, no, that's not the right word. I'm trying to say that for a long time when I was young, you know, like everybody else, I wanted to believe, well, I like to believe, I did believe that he, he was invincible. Yeah. And then the more I got into, um, when I started training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and then, then doing some, doing some wrestling, doing some boxing, doing some Thai boxing and all that, that's when I realized that, hmm, you know, and like, no, I think he was, he was just a man. Um, he was very intelligent and he did a lot of things and he brought, uh, you know, Kung Fu to, um, what do you call it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the public, so to speak. He popularized, popularized Kung Fu and made it, uh, uh, open up a lot of doors to, you know, to all the things that are going on today, so to speak. But he was just human. Yeah. He you was know, guy and, pointed his finger in the right direction. And to paraphrase a Bruce Lee quote, if you focus on the finger instead of what you're pointing at. Oh man, you 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 just you missed the whole point. But that's what a lot of Bruce Lee fans do. They focus on his finger instead of what he actually pointed at. Like, hey guys, go lift some weights and train and and learn a bunch of different martial arts and and uh, you know take the best of everything and and skip out on 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 the jump training. And everyone's like, oh look at that finger. Oh that finger's so amazing. Oh, exactly. I think Bruce Lee exactly. would be. I think Bruce Lee would be shocked and appalled by the way people hold him up on a pedestal today. Yeah, yeah, I think so, I think so. And it's, it's, so, it's so true what you're saying there, like that, that scene in Enter the Dragon where he's teaching that, uh, that young kid and he's pointing at the moon and all that and he's, he's saying all that, like that's exactly what's, what, what tends to happen with people who worship Bruce Lee to that, to that, to that extent, to that level, you know? And uh, yeah, he was just a man and I mean, Oh man, you just, you just got excommunicated from the Church of Jeet Kune Do, my friend. Oh yeah, yeah, that's okay with that. I mean, they could come challenge me when when things open up again. I could tell them where my club is, and they could come, and we'll we'll, we'll duke it out. We'll film it, have some fun. <laughs> I don't mind, you know. And uh, yeah, but you know, the one thing, like, okay, you know how those Wing Chun people say that, oh, Wing Chun, Bruce Lee, Wing Chun, and all that. But then you made me realize in one of your videos is that well, actually, what happens is that. He he performed very poorly against uh, Wong Jackman, yeah. And that's why that's why he essentially was like, "Oh, holy crap! Wait, wait, this stuff doesn't work." Yeah. Now I gotta go. I, I, I realized he find... was in terrible shape. Like that, that's one of the that's one of the moments in his life that inspired him to get physically fit because he, I mean, he he got gassed very quickly and he was like, "Man, that fight was what like a a, a minute." A couple minutes tops, and, and I feel like crap. I don't like this. I, and you know, a, after that moment, he started you know really pushing himself. And I got a lot of comments on that video saying, oh, "That wouldn't happen. Nobody who wins a fight uh, thinks like that." And those people haven't been in real fights. I I just um, coached a bunch of my students um, for their first amateur fights. There there was a a fight show here in Shanghai um, on Saturday. And you know, one of my students, Ali, you've seen him in a few, a few of my videos. You know, he's, a, he's a 
dude from Bosnia, a tough athletic guy. And he has his first amateur boxing match. He comes from a karate background. Um, but his first amateur boxing match, and he won. Three-round decision, you know, decent performance. But afterward, he comes up to me, and he says, I'm so sorry, coach. I'm so sorry I disappointed you. And, and he was so unhappy with his performance because he got tired. He gassed out. You know, he's, he, um, he didn't stick to the game plan. He didn't box the way, you know, in, in, in this fight that he did in the gym. And he was like, man, I've got such a long way to go. And I was like, good. It's good you recognize that. It's good you recognize that because most, most people, you know, when they win, they pat themselves on the back and everyone's like, good job, you won. And they feel good about that. And, you know, maybe they'll think I can improve this. I, I, I can improve this detail here. But I was actually really happy to see how disappointed he was in his performance because I was like, that is the emotional content that elicits change, positive change. Like this guy is going to make some changes and next time he's going to get better. And I can tell next time he's going to win his next fight. And he's going to come out of that fight disappointed. And he's going to be like, man, I mucked that one up too. And then he's going to fight a tougher guy and he's going to beat that dude. He's going to do a little better, but he's going to be that much more disappointed. And it's, it sounds like a terrible process, but it's a beautiful thing be able to yeah. critique yourself to that level and I think that's it, of, right? yeah, oh, oh, exactly sorry, the bruce sorry. lee fan, they, they hate hearing me talk like that about bruce lee that he was disappointed in himself even though you know he wrote about that his his wife went into detail about how how disappointed he was in his own performance but it's the truth that is what a that is what a good martial artist does well i think that not now that we're talking about it, it just made me think of something. I think that uh, himself, he was probably dis uh, he was uh, he was under the illusion that he could fight mm -hmm. because he, fought, he 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 got into some street fights in Hong Kong, beat up a couple of guys here and there. Which when he was a kid, on the way. Hmm? When he was a kid, he was a teenager when he had those fights. Yeah, and like kids totally fighting other kids. Other kids versus fighting a grown man. Exactly, kids fighting other kids who where both kids don't really know how to fight. They just know a little couple of, uh, you know, passes here and there that they might have picked up. But, I mean, that means absolutely nothing, right? And then he went and trained, and then he was all into his, his thing, thinking that what he knows is really efficient and really works, and he was cocky about it. And I think now that we're talking about it, I think he essentially realized after, like, the fight with Wong Jack Man that he, he realized he couldn't really fight. I yeah. think he realized that in a big way, and that's why he went. He went. He started looking for the truth now, right? So he wanted to learn how to fight, and then that's when he started like studying boxing, grappling, and all kinds of stuff. And eventually, um, you know, he broke his back, and he he had time to sit down and think about Jeet Kune Do and all that. And so, I think that's it. That's it. Like he did. He he when he practically got, well, he won. But I mean, he could have easily lost. Yeah. That's what I think would happen. And he realized, shit, I don't, I don't know how to fight. And I'm, yeah, I'm going was, about, I have all these schools that I'm teaching. Yeah. You know, and exactly. I'm teaching not pure nonsense because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I got to figure this out because this can't, like, this, this, is, this is not like, you know, it's his pride probably took a big hit there. And that's oh, when yeah. he's like, yeah, I got to really study this and, and figure it out. And I think he did to a certain extent. And, uh, but I mean... Yeah, anybody who's never been in, uh, who com who's never competed in a combat, combat, um, you know, sport or, or fought, you know, uh, in a ring or anything like that, I mean, yeah, of course, like, you could, um, you don't really know what it's like. It's, it's, you could win and still realize that you suck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, you know, the guy made one more mistake than you did. You got and, lucky, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's all it is. Like, cause you know, I I compete in judo, and there are times when I'm like, I can't believe I won that, and I won by like one point just because the guy made a mistake, and I cap I was able to capitalize on a little technicality. You know, I, I held him down a little bit longer, and then we ran out of time, and I won, but I still know that that was a crappy victory. It wasn't yeah. nothing that to was, be proud. Of. That was my experience with my first pro MMA fight. I won my first pro MMA fight, not because I knew anything about mixed martial arts, because I didn't. I, I went straight from 
professional kickboxing to MMA because I got challenged by this dude on the internet back in the day. <laughs> and uh, he challenged me to an MMA fight. This guy had a few fights under his belt. He had like um, like one win, two losses, something like that. And, um, and he challenged me. He said, you're just a kickboxer. I was like, well, I'm, I'm pragmatic. Let's fight. Let's see what happens. And, and I won not because... I was any good at MMA, not because I knew how to grapple, none of that. I just, he sucked a little bit more than I did. And he made one more mistake than I did. And after I got out of the fight, I had a broken foot and I couldn't even walk. And I was like, did I really win though? Like at one point, this guy lifted me up over his head and slammed me on the ground. And I was like, crap, I don't even know how to defend a takedown. And, and he gets on top and I try to, try to you know grapple and I'm like crap I don't know how to grapple and at one point I, I got my legs around him in a position similar to a triangle choke and I was like crap I don't even know what a triangle choke is or how to finish this and of course he he gets out right away and I scramble back up to my feet and, and eventually I, I uh, land a few liver shots that drop him to his knees and eventually he starts tapping because I keep hitting him in the side I'm like dang I got lucky I got so lucky in that fight but everybody's like, yeah, you're so awesome. And, and the temptation to give in to the adulation of the crowd is tremendous. The temptation to think, oh, man, I'm so good because I have my hand raised at the end is tremendous. But if you're honest, if you're an honest martial artist and you go through an experience like that, win or lose, you will realize I have a lot of homework to do. I need to learn how to fight. I need to learn this new sport whatever the situation is. And I think that's exactly what Bruce Lee went through as well. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it takes nothing away about how I, my respect for the man. Like, he's still yeah. my childhood hero. He's done yes. a lot for, you know, uh, martial arts, bringing kung fu to, you know, the public and all that. And I still like to believe that he's invincible, but I know that, um, uh, that he's not. You know, that he's yeah. just a man. But that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There, 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 you know, it's, not, it's not even being disrespectful. You know, like what he did was amazing for, uh, you know, for martial arts and everything. And he was very talented, in my opinion. He was very fast. He was very strong. Uh, you know, it's just that he, he didn't have time to continue his evolution. Because yeah. imagine, he died at the age of 32. Imagine if he would have had time to continue and to see MMA uh, come about. I think he would have he would have gotten involved, maybe not necessarily himself, but he would have he he would have trained some people to uh, to to go in the cage and 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 find the tr find out the truth of of all of this. I think he maybe. would have been down with that hundred percent. Maybe not himself. Maybe he would have been too old, but he would have been involved. You know how we trained um, supposedly? Like you're gonna have to correct me if I'm wrong here, because my my martial art history is you know fuzzy. Sure. But he, he trained Joe Lewis, right? Uh, yeah, I believe they trained together. Joe Lewis spoke very highly of, of Bruce Lee. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think he trained, okay, this is a little bit, did he train Chuck Norris or, or, or not? I'm not sure about that. Yeah, it depends on who you ask. Chuck Norris gave an interview where he said he taught Bruce Lee how to kick. Like, according to Chuck Norris, they, they were friends, and <laughs> they trained together from time to time, but, um... You know, the, the Bruce Lee fanboys will say that Chuck Norris was a student of Bruce Lee. The, the Chuck Norris fanboys will say Bruce Lee was a student of Chuck Norris. In Chuck Norris's own words, he said, um, when they trained together, Bruce Lee would at first, you know, repeat the Wing Chun dogma, no kicks above the waist, just kick the legs. It compromises your balance. And, and Chuck Norris, in his words, basically said, you know, Bruce, you're really athletic and flexible and all this you should really incorporate these kicks into your into your movement as well which mm. I know irritates irritates the the church of jeet kundo but that's what that's what chuck norris said man <laughs> according to chuck norris he taught bruce lee all the high spinning kicks that we saw in his movies well you know what i i wouldn't have a hard time believing that at all i mean chuck norris was uh you know he was a champion uh, kickboxer right uh, if i'm not mistaken yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised because I think that, and I, I've read that before too, that Bruce Lee at one point, he was against kicking, like, and then somebody opened up his mind to that and I didn't realize it was Chuck, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if, you know, that's, that's what happened. 
and uh, who else was um, and you know Gene LaBelle. Gene LaBelle is is the one who taught Bruce how to how to grapple. Uh huh. Like he, yeah. They trained. Yeah. Uh, I remember reading that they trained together for a year in in judo and and submission and and stuff like that. And so he he was he was starting towards the end. He was starting to pick up on the grappling a little bit. But once again, he died too early, and you know, uh, he he couldn't continue his evolution. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Did you ever hear the story about how they uh, how they met? Like uh, oh, Gene, uh, Le- Gene Lavelle and Bruce Lee. I yeah, yeah. It had something to do with uh, stunt work in Hollywood, but I don't know. Exactly, stunt work in Hollywood, and then at one point, uh, Gene Lavelle grabbed Bruce and picked him up in the air. Started walking around with him. I forgot what was the exact reason, but you know, they were like you know, they, on a movie set, you know, Gene LaBelle was a stunt guy, and Bruce was probably, I don't know, they, they probably had an exchange. And then, anyways, Gene LaBelle supposedly, I think Joe Rogan talked about this on one of his podcasts, but yeah. picked him up, grabbed him, picked him up like this, and started walking around. And I think Bruce said something like, "Let me go, let me go, or I'll kill you." And then Gene LaBelle <laughs> said, "Like, I can't, cause you're gonna kill me." <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's when when Bruce realized, like, holy crap, this guy is strong. Like he, oh, he yeah. could snap me in half with his. Bell in his prime, man. Him. That dude was that dude was jacked. I mean, he yeah. he did he did things like that as as a professional wrestler. He wasn't just a judoka, but he was also a professional wrestler as well. And he did stunts like that in the ring where he would you know lift people up and carry them. And uh, man, Gene Labelle. I don't think he gets enough credit. Like people always talk about Bruce Lee as being the father of MMA because Dana White popularized that expression. But Gene LaBelle actually did MMA fights before MMA was a thing. Like when he fought, um, um, what's his name? Savage, the uh, boxer. Um, like it on his first, Milo Savage, the boxer. And that, that had goofy rules. Like Gene LaBelle insisted that Milo Savage wear uh, a gi top and um which I, I think is kind of silly if you if if you're gonna if you're gonna fight just just fight let the boxer let the boxer box let the judo guy do judo but um so they had kind of a screwy rule set where you know milo savage had to wear a gi top and um milo also wore like uh, fingerless bag gloves which was kind of strange but ultimately, uh, Gene LaBelle threw him on the floor and choked him out. You know, what you would expect a master grappler to do against a guy who doesn't know how to grapple. But, mm-hmm. you know, for those who watched it at the time, they were kind of shocked. Like, what? Impossible. Boxing is a more popular sport than judo. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore, it must be more effective. That's how we tend to think. It's more popular, so it must be more effective. The near expo- exposure effect is very powerful. Mm. But... You know, all the mystique about Bruce Lee is fascinating, but it reminds me of something else I was thinking about the other day. I've been getting a lot of comments about Frank Dukes on my channel recently. You know Frank Dukes, the, the guy well, who uh, yeah, came yeah, up yeah, with a story that turned into blood sport. And, you know, he's he has some truly outlandish claims. And um, there, there are some Frank Dukes fans that, that come after me because I've made a few videos where, you know, I kind of poke fun of uh, him, at him a little bit because, you know, you, you, you simply cannot have a 62-round single elimination tournament, for example, without like 73 trillion human beings. But um, in my heart of hearts, nobody, nobody wants the Kumite to be real more than me. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. If if Frank Dukes were to come out and prove us all wrong and produce like proof that his kumite actually happened, in my heart I would be like, yes. <laughs> but in the meantime, in the meantime, I remain skeptical. So there, there's something about like those those childhood heroes, you know, those those larger than life illusions that we have as children about Marsha that, um, you know, we, we secretly hope is true, but what you brought up about Bruce Lee, the fact that he was just a man, I think that, that in many ways is more inspiring. And I'll tell you why. Because that means it's real. That means what he did is achievable. That means, you know, if Bruce Lee is strong and fast, you can be strong and fast too, because you are a man too, right? 
if Bruce Lee did great things in cinema, you know what, that's achievable too. If Bruce Lee did great things in terms of, you know, his philosophy, awesome, because that means you can do that too, right? Anyone who is truly inspiring is someone who shows you the way, who shows you this is something that is possible. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Like, that's the problem when you put somebody in a pedal on a pedestal, right? It means that they're so special that that means that you're not. And yeah. that, that means that what they did would be impossible for you to do, which is, okay, well, what's the point of that? But, um, and even Bruce Lee, he said it, right, in one of his interviews where he said he doesn't want to be seen as a star because that's an illusion. Yeah. He wants to be seen as a great actor. And I think Bruce Lee himself, he would have wanted to inspire people in a way where make people believe that they could do what he does if they actually put in the work, mm. you know, and, and, and so on and so on. He wouldn't have wanted people to see him as a, as a god or anything like that. And, yeah, um, yeah and, and to, to get back to, like, the whole Kumite thing, like, I love that movie. And, and you know, like, if, if, if that was a real thing, yeah, I'd, you know, but, of course, it's, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> But you know one thing that really inspired me, and now I wanna, I wanna ask you more about this. You know that eighty-year-old yes. man that you said did yes. Tai Chi and that essentially whooped your butt? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is he still around today, or is he? I don't know. I haven't seen him in over a decade, so I don't know if he's still alive. Um, if if anybody's watching this and they are in China, he lived in Jiangsu Province in the city of Zhengzhou, and and. If you know where the vinegar factory is, there's a famous vinegar brand, uh, Zhenzhong Vinegar. It's known all over China. But he would train right next to the factory at a plaza right there. And he would train there every morning at 7 a.m. The man was named Wu Dao Shui. I don't know if that's a nickname or if that was his actual gift because uh, the translation is literally fish follows water. And mm -hmm. I think it might be a nickname because that, that's kind of how he moved. Because he stood in a parallel stance when I sparred with him. He, he stood in a parallel stance, and I thought, this is really weird. He had his hands down by his side. And at first, I, I just tried to grapple with him, you know, like, uh, you know, he's old, he's, he's much smaller than me, so, so I'll, you know, do that thing that, um, you know, we were talking about with Mifune students, you know, mm -hmm. being respect to the older gentleman, basically. But as soon as I touched him, he grabbed my hand, and he wrist-locked me, and and throws me on the ground. And I get up, I'm like, ow, that really hurt. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get an underhook on this guy, and then he won't be able to do that. And so, you know, he's just standing there in his parallel stance, and I start reaching for the underhook, and as soon as my, I make physical contact with me, he throws me like a hip toss. And I get up again, I'm like, because we're not training on mats, we're training like on a, a plaza with stone tiles. And I banged up my elbow pretty badly. And I get up and he's like, come on, this time again, with power. And so, you know, I, I go at him and I'm still just grappling. And, and, you know, he throws me on the floor several different ways and sweeps me and does like a snap down and, and trips me. And, and um, you know, they're, they're wrestling moves, like basic wrestling moves you'll see in freestyle wrestling, Greco-Roman wrestling, you know, um, joint locks you'll see in jujitsu and judo. And, like, movements, nothing really surprised me. Like, oh, here's some magic move I've never heard of before. Um, until he said, all right, for real, fight me, punch, kick, do that UFC stuff. I was like, all right, old man's not playing around. Let's, let's see what he has. And so I start punching at him. And he's still standing in the parallel stance. And then he starts slipping and bobbing and weaving. I'm like, that's Tai Chi? What the heck? And he's bobbing and weaving and slipping as I'm trying to punch him. And then he comes up under and he grabs me again and puts me on the ground. And like everything he's doing is grappling. Like everything he's doing is grappling. Like stuff you would see, like high level judo, high level jujitsu. And, um, and it's shocking to me. One, because like in popular culture, Tai Chi is always presented as like this fancy looking, striking art. Like um, if you play any video game that has a Tai Chi character on their fighting roster, it's always like striking because that's how video games are. And in my mind, that's, that's just how I pictured Tai Chi. And it, it blew my mind that it was grappling 
first of all. And then I throw a front kick at the guy and he catches the front kick and sweeps me. And it's, it's um, you know, the golf swing takedown. You'll see um, wrestlers like Kerry Kola teaches this on, on his channel. Uh, it's, it's not a super well-known wrestling takedown, but it's become one of my favorites. You know, it's a technique you'll see a lot of Sanda fighters. It's very popular in Sanda, Chinese uh, kickboxing, basically, that allows throws and takedowns as well. And, you know, since this old man did this to me, I'm like, dang, I got to learn that. I need to learn this move. It's become one of my favorite moves as well. Also one of my favorite guard passes. Like, um, if somebody's on the ground already and you can get a hold of their ankle, you do the same movement. Essentially, you move them from this to the side and you can shoot right over into knee on belly position. Mm. And... Um, Anyway, I, I learned a tremendous amount from this old guy. And so he, he beats me up and throws me on the ground a lot. And eventually I'm like, okay, I'm sick of getting thrown on the ground. This sucks. Training without mats is terrible. And again, when I tell this story, people are like, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Because I think, first of all, they're picturing that Tai Chi is magic. And um, Tai Chi twin is not magic. Like They're, they're basically... There are a bunch of different styles of Tai Chi, but it basically comes down to two schools. Tai Chi Twin, which is the, the unarmed form. Twin is fist in, in, in Chinese, but fist doesn't mean punching. It just means that it's a it's a hand-to-hand -hand combat system. And then there's Tai Chi Jin, the sword style, which is sword fighting. And it's kind of interesting that they pair sword fighting and grappling together because if you look at uh, you know other historical sword fighting styles like um, like Kenjutsu, Japanese sword fighting, that that is coupled with Jujutsu, Japanese grappling, if you will. And why does grappling and sword fighting go together? And it's the same thing with Western uh, sword fighting as well. For example, there was um, I believe it was an Italian swordsman wrote this uh, a book. It's not a long one, but it's, it's an old treatise on um, on the rapier, you know, that long, um, kind of thin, but, but sharp sword that a uh, gentleman would duel with back in the day. And he wrote this kind of confusing thing, which is in single rapier combat, the better wrestler almost always kills his opponent. If neither man knows how to wrestle, the stronger man almost always kills his opponent. And when I first read that, I thought, well, but they have swords, they have sharp swords. Why, why would wrestling or strength matter? And then I realized, you know, just studying more about um, historical martial arts and kenjutsu and, and so on, when the swords cross into a bind, which they do all the time, as soon as you cross blades, that happens almost instantly in a sword fight. And when you're playing with a long sword, basically, you know, it becomes a grappling situation very quickly. And the longer the sword, you know, the deeper that bind can become and the the more important grappling becomes, which is why the, you know, the samurai used jujitsu, which later became judo and Brazilian jujitsu and so on. And that is why when you read these old like German sword fighting codices, there's so much emphasis on wrestling technique. And where was I going with this? Oh yes, Tai Chi. So Tai Chi is divided up into essentially these two schools, the grappling aspect, Tai Chi Twin, and the sword aspect, Tai Chi Jin. So, but today in, in modern culture, it's, it's, been, it's been relegated to basically, um, you know, exercises for old people that they do in the park and nothing else, right? Very few people use Tai Chi in actual combat anymore, and most people don't even remember what it's for. It would be like if, if people forgot what wrestling was for, okay? If nobody rem remembered what wrestling was for, except maybe four or five old guys who, who still remember, but everybody else still practiced shadow wrestling. And if every morning, you know, the old people would go out and put on their wrestling singlets and do some shadow wrestling, and shadow wrestling looks goofy. Right. You do like do you, do you ever do like shadow judo by yourself? Well, um uh shadow judo, yeah, yeah, you could do that. You could practice your moves. But I mean I, yeah. I also wrestle now. It's been uh I've been wrestling now for maybe a total of a year. 
but it's something that I do regularly. So my usual schedule is judo three times a week and wrestling two times a week, freestyle wrestling. So I'm actually, yeah. I actually understand like wrestling, double legs, single legs, and, and you know, I'm getting um, more and more knowledgeable as time goes on because I used to just <laughs> focus on judo. But then when I realized that if I wrestling actually would benefit my judo. So even when you, you, t- you, you uh, what you're saying here about uh, shadow wrestling, I could, yeah. I could do it. I, I like, I, I perfectly understand what you mean. I could do the, you know, Indeed. like arm drag, you know, single leg, you know, come yeah, back what does up. It look like when you do it by yourself. It, it looks like it without looks context, like tai chi. It, looks it looks like, you know, like these, these yeah, you go for an arm drag and it's like, hmm. and this, this is a Tai Chi movement, this, you know, doing this thing and you do it by yourself and it looks like you're trying to be a wizard <laughs> casting a spell, but mm-hmm. no. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it makes sense to me. Like, uh, but you're right about that. I think that's that's the thing. Like, now that you explain it in terms of uh, the two styles, where you have Tai Chi grappling and Tai Chi sword, like hand Tai Chi hand to hand and Tai Chi sword, and how essentially when there's a sword fight, you're gonna clash and you're gonna end up like really close. And when you're close, well, you're not gonna like disengage uh, respectfully and then start again. No, you're gonna you know uh, capitalize on. Uh, wherever you can in that position, so that's going to that's going that's where the grappling aspect of it comes in. So now it makes a lot of sense, and and I think that a lot of people, you're right about that. I think a lot of people don't even know, even people who teach Tai Chi, or who are supposedly masters, might have forgotten this, and yeah. they don't, they just don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to explain it properly. They don't know how to teach it because they don't have the whole thing, the whole package. So. You know, for for a Tai Chi master to tell you that Tai Chi is is for um, uh, you know hand to hand combat and like he might not actually know what he's talking about and it's not going to translate very well when you actually get into a fight. But if you actually understood the whole system and somebody taught it to you properly in the context of sword fighting and then you have to grapple, you could actually make it work. Because what what I believe this eighty year old man. Um, uh, like, I don't believe it's magic what he did. I think he just has a very high level of skill, like kind of like Mifune, right? Yeah. And he has so much uh, awareness in terms of um, uh, tactical awareness. And he's so aware of how his body moves, how your body moves, and how to off-balance you, you know, and so on. That's why he's able to um, do what he did. And, and I, I, I 100% believe that's possible, but it's very rare that you meet an 80-year-old man Who's a, who was able to do that, first of all. And then when you said that, he could do a backflip. Mm. In my mind, yes. this guy was in shape. He was know, a... that, that shocked me more than the fact that he was able to, you know, outgrapple me. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've met strong older gentlemen. Like, I grew up in a small farming town. And I, I got to, you know, at advanced stages, we're, we're doing serious physical labor. And just really strong guys. But when this guy was doing backflips, I was like, okay, this isn't real. This is, this is like CGI or something. What is, <laughs> but, oh man, but he was, man, he was that, that's the, uh, that is the craziest detail of that whole story to me. The fact that he was able to do backflips and here at, well, there I was at the time, like, uh, I was like 30 years old when I met him 42 now, but, um, I was like, I can't do a backflip. And I'm like a fraction of his age. There's something seriously wrong here. But it was yeah. inspiring. It was really inspiring. At that point, I was like, all right, my lifelong goal, be able to do a backflip before the age of 80. Still working on it. But you know what? That, it's a funny thing you say that, but actually that's one of my things too. I want to be able to do a backflip and a front flip. And, and then, uh, you know, in, in terms of acrobatics, right? Because that yeah. would... That would mean like I have a certain level of control over my body, which is something I want to be able to achieve. And hearing you say that, I know it's not BS because it's you. Like uh, you're not, I don't, you're not the type of guy to like uh, lie about that kind of stuff. Um, so it's very inspiring actually to hear that an 80 year old man could move like that and not only move like that, but could even fight. So yeah. essentially I want to be that guy in, in like in about 40 years. <laughs> yeah, man. What was so amazing about this experience to me, it was like, at this point, I was, I was feeling like, uh, feeling like giving up on martial arts in, in, in a big way. I was like, man, I, I, I'm not really accomplishing what I want to accomplish. 
And then I meet this guy, and this was one of the most ins inspiring instances of my life, especially when I asked him afterward, how long did it take you to master Tai Chi? And he starts laughing, very jovial guy, funny dude. And he says, oh, about 80 years. Took me 80 years to master Tai Chi. I'm like, wait, are, you're 80 years old. And he's like, exactly, exactly. It takes a lifetime is what he's saying. Essentially, just don't give up. Just keep doing it every day. I'm like, well, how often do you train? How many hours a day do you train? And he laughs even more. He's like, I train an hour a day between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. Then I go to work. Like this guy was still working. He wasn't retired. He was, he was a, a chauffeur, like a professional chauffeur for the guy who owned the vinegar factory. And mm. I was like, man, this is so strange. Because again, in America, by, by the age of 80, people are retired, living in a nursing home. They're not, they're not physical, but they're also not working either. But this guy, he didn't give up on life at all. And I think a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of Americans give up on life early. For example, a lot of people stop doing sports when they finish high school. And then even more people give up on sports when they finish college. And after college, you, you, don't, have, you don't have venues to compete in sports anymore. You can't just, I mean, sometimes you might have a pickup game of basketball with your friends, but other than that, eh, there's no wrestling team to join. There's no, there's no lacrosse team. There's no football team. And so people just sort of give up and go to work and grow a gut and slowly wait to die. But what this old man taught me is you don't have to. You don't have to slowly wait to die. You can, you can get out there and train every day and, and training a little bit every day consistently is much more important than trying to cram a lot in at once. Yeah. And this is, yeah. This is a principle that was really reinforced to me when I learned how to use the speed bag. Like I went my whole pro fighting career without ever touching a speed bag. I thought it was nonsense. I thought it was silly junk training. And when, when I retired from fighting and started coaching full time, uh, new students would come into my gym and they would see a speed bag on the wall and they, they would say, how, Hey, how do you use that? And I would be like, um, this is embarrassing, but I don't actually know. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to learn the speed bag. And I'm, I'm so glad I did because there are so many practical applications to the speed bag that uh, I've gained for, for fighting. Um, but I went, to, I went to YouTube to look up some videos and, and guys were like, okay, you hit the speed bag like this. No, you hit the speed bag like that. But the most important video, I don't even remember the dude's name, but he looks like Kurt Vonnegut, has like an afro and and um, it's a really old video. And he said, okay, I'm going to show you a, a basic speed bag pattern. Here's another one, but here's something even more important than the patterns. And that is practice this thing for 10 minutes every single day and do that consistently for three or four months. And that will equate to 10 hours of actual practice. Now, if you sit down right here, right now, and hammer out 10 hours in a row on the speed bag, you will not be any better at hour 10 than you will be at hour one. But if you spread that 10 hours out over three or four months and train consistently for 10 minutes a day, then you will look like a professional after three or four months. You'll look better than Rocky does in the Rocky movies, which really isn't that hard. It just takes consistency. And so I took him at his word and I realized that improvement does not come from repetition to repetition, it comes from sleep to sleep. There's so much wisdom in the method that he taught. Train consistently in manageable chunks each day and do that every day for a long period of time. And that will give you the magic power that you so desire, if you will. That will yield the results. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy what could be done in... Um when you're just consistent at something, you know? And it's a funny thing too, because what you just said right there is really interesting in regards to if you do 10 hours of speed bag, whereas instead if you separate it like 10 minutes a day for, you know, X amount of time, you'll actually get better results. And I think that because 
I think that you have to be mindful when you do something. So when you do something, you have to do it. You have to make sure that you're doing it properly. And then you have to like figure out what's the next step in your head so that you could, you know, continue to improve on that specific uh, skill that you're trying to develop like that or that specific drill, you know, yeah. to actually progress it through because supposedly it's, um, and, and I, I, I was listening to this, uh, um, this interview with uh, John Danaher. You ever heard of him? The, yes. Um, from, from Henzo Gracie, uh, the death squad. Yeah. John Danaher. I love it when he says the fundamental asymmetry of the human body is <laughs> he starts so many sentences that way. Oh, he does. Okay. Okay. But you know, I, I, I listened to him a couple of times before and I found him like, this guy's a genius. I really think he's, uh, uh, he knows what he's talking about and he has a very deep understanding yeah. of, of, you know, like, uh, of, of martial arts and grappling especially. And he was he explaining how essentially if you drill, cause he doesn't believe in drilling. He says that if you just drill and you put a number in your head, like, okay, I'm going to do a hundred guard passes. Mm. Okay. That sounds like, but it's not actually going to necessarily make you good at guard passing. What you have to do is that you have to, you have to have progressive, uh, overload. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm sure I'm not using the right term here, but you got to progress that drill properly. So at the beginning, okay, you do a regular guard pass, but then after that, you might need your, um, once you do about, let's say a hundred of them, well, the next hundred can't be the same type of, of drill anymore. Now it's going to be a guard pass, but maybe your opponent is going to grab, is going to uh, give a little bit of resistance or you're going to give a yeah. little fake to the left and then go to the right. And then, and you have to develop. So you got to progressively, um, o progressive overload your drill or your, your training, so to speak, so that you get actually get better at it. Whereas yes. if you're just doing the same thing mindlessly, uh, for reps, just for out time, a sequence. yeah, that, that only gets you so far that just teaches you the move. Mm -hmm. I'm. There's a um, Dennis Kelly. He's he's a jujitsu black belt and also a judo black belt. Um, I believe he lives in Australia. He's from Ireland originally, but he visited me in Shanghai and um, and he did a did a seminar about the omoplata at my gym, and it was just you know really basic information about the omoplata. And afterwards, I, I asked him, like, how would you how would you suggest practicing the omoplata? Like, you, like you, you've taught us the technique, how would you suggest practicing it? And he said, okay, let's do it like this. We're going to start the roll like uh, about two thirds of the way into the submission. So we've cleared the shoulder, right? We're almost at the end of the omoplata, right? All you have to do is, you know, sit up and twist and grab and then you have it, right? But the other guy's gonna fight back. And so we, we drill, uh, I, I use the word drill differently than, than most people. A lot of people say drill when I say sequence. Um, so when I say drill, I mean, there's an element of resistance. That means you fight back, but there's a very specific objective you're trying to accomplish. And a drill is going to be fairly short, like maybe 30 seconds, maybe 10 seconds, right? Whereas a sequence is like you put your, you, you go through the motions. Right. Mm -hmm. So sequencing the omoplata, you you go through the movement with a completely cooperative partner. So you learn how the movement works, how to move your body. Right. But the drill that uh, that Dennis Kelly put us through was this. We start with the omoplata almost completed. There's just one little thing to do, but the other guy fights back. So we have like 10 second reps of this, like see if you can finish in 10 seconds and I realized right away, okay, we're learning something very valuable on both ends of the spectrum, how to defend, how to finish. Because a lot of jiu-jitsu classes are taught like this. They'll sequence a technique for like 30 minutes or so. They'll do a certain number of repetitions, like we're going to do omoplatas today, sequence it, go through the motions 30 times with your partner. Okay, good. Now let's roll. And then you roll and you start from whatever position, either they start standing or start from the ground, whatever. But maybe they'll get into a position to even attempt an omoplata once in the hour that they're rolling. And maybe not at all. And maybe in that one time they get in position to attempt the omoplata, the guy gets out before they even get to the end. And so they don't even know what it feels like. 
trying to finish an omoplata against a resisting opponent. And then they go back to class and in the next year, maybe they get into a, a position to attempt the omoplata five or six times, okay, against a resisting opponent in all those roles. And how much improvement do they get? How good do they get at omoplatas in that year? Uh, not very much. <laughs> okay. But there's this method that Dennis Kelly showed us, like start when you're almost finished and resist and do that in 10 second incre increments, do it a whole bunch of times and then take it a step backwards. Okay, so you're like two steps away from finishing and then we fight for it and then take it back one more step. Now we're three steps away from finishing and then take it back four steps. We're four steps away from finishing. So exactly what you're saying, that progressive overload if you will, make it a little bit more difficult each time. But each step along the way, we, ha we get the experience of fighting through each phase that we wouldn't necessarily get the reps in in live sparring. And this is something that I have I've taken to heart and I, I do this constantly. Uh, and since I've started training this way, a lot of people come to me and they're like, dude, you you you're not like other gyms. I'm like, good, because I don't want to be. Because the average gym, what are they? They're average. What does the average gym do? They, they do what everybody else is doing, and they get the same results everybody else gets, and they exist in mediocrity. And what do I want to do? I want to train fighters who consistently win as many fights as possible. I want to give them the best possible opportunity they can to win when they compete. And in order to do that, you need to use the best possible training methods. And so, you know, like John Danaher says, he, he says these things that shock people, like drilling is not as important as you think it is when we're, we're, we're saying drilling to mean sequencing, right? Mm -hmm. And that shocks people because that's how most people train. And then you look at a guy like Faraz Zahabi, who's always saying these very um, shocking things, like you don't need to do with pad work. And people are like, what? No, people lose their minds. Like, of course I need to do pad work. And, um, you know, people like me who tell people road work is not as necessary as most fighters think it is. And they're like, what? But boxers have been doing road work for forever. Okay. And, and people challenge these ideas. And it makes sense to challenge people who are challenging conventional wisdom. But you also have to ask yourself, is it? Is, are your training methods giving you the results that you want? And if not, why not? Critical thinking has a, one of the most important rules in martial arts, and yet we tend to simply defer to authority. We, we fall into the logical fallacy of an appeal to authority. I mean, how often do people advertise themselves as you know, you should come to my gym, you should, you should come to my class because I'm an authority on this subject. You should watch my YouTube channel on martial arts because I'm, author I'm an authority on this subject. I have this rank and this belt and, and this championship. Eh, okay, and that's all great. And those, those are tags that get people's attention. And those are all positive signs that maybe you know what you're doing. But you also have to ask yourself, are my methods giving my students the results that they want? And if not, why not? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Which, which brings me to my friend's question. So this is for, uh, this is for my buddy, Anthony. So Anthony, I know you're going to be listening to this. Um, so his question, because he wants to get into MMA. Yeah. Uh, to, he wants to become a professional MMA fighter. And well, obviously he has to go through uh, the process, which is well, he has to train, which he's started. He started doing training at an MMA gym. He's down in Florida, and he's 25. And his question is, how do you? What's the best way to go about it to become a professional MMA fighter? In a sense that, like, what is it that you have to? What are the the important things that you have to look out for? Like, is it the gym? Is it the coach? Is it uh, what kind of environment that you have to be in? How many matches? Uh, I don't know, like how many amateur matches should you have before you, you go pro 
and so on. I know in some of your videos you said ten, the first ten matches you have suck. So is it better yes. to stay to do the first ten in amateur before you go pro, or you know, and and yeah, that that's his question because that's what he wants to do. Okay, well, as as far as the the number of amateur matches you should have, amateur combat sports experience of any type is super valuable going into MMA, whether that is judo or jujitsu or wrestling or boxing or even if it's not an M MMA, the fact that you are performing in this high stress situation, experiencing all the intangibles that you don't experience in the gym. For example, the performance anxiety, the crowds, the lights, the cheers, the booze. This has a profound effect on, on psychology. And one of the most crippling things for a fighter, especially a new fighter, is the performance anxiety. For example, mm -hmm. I talked about my, my student Ali, who is a, a phenomenal athlete. He's a tremendous athlete. And he grossly underperformed in his fight on Saturday, even though he won. Right? But he grossly underperformed. Like, if you looked at him on the fight on Saturday versus the way he performs in the gym, it's like two different people. It's mm -hmm. like a Jekyll and Hyde situation there. And this was shocking to him, but it wasn't shocking to me because that's, that's normal in a first amateur fight. That is normal the first time you step in front of a crowd to essentially forget who you are and create an imaginary monster in your mind called the fight. You know, so instead of having two entities in the fight, you and your opponent, there's three. There's you, your opponent, and the fight itself. And, and yeah, man, we got to kill the fight before we can, before we can uh, conquer our opponent. Right? Okay, okay. Yeah. So that's, that's what these first ten amateur experiences do for us. They allow us to, to conquer, the, conquer the fight, you know, that third entity in the cage, if you will. So, you know, we're, we're just fighting one person instead of two. Um, I think this is why wrestlers do so well in mixed martial arts. It's not so much that wrestling is, is the greatest grappling system. It's awesome. It's great. Wrestling has a ton to offer for mixed martial artists. And I think everybody should wrestle. But what wrestling really brings to the table is the fact that, um, you know, the average American high school wrestler, by the time they finish high school, how many wrestling matches have they done? live in front of a crowd, in front of people cheering and booing and making noise and all the intangibles you can't train for in the gym. A bunch. They have a bunch of amateur matches. Even people who weren't that competitive still have a bunch of matches. And so when they go into MMA for the first time, they're like, this, this part of the game isn't new. Being in front of people isn't new. The performance anxiety isn't new. The butterflies and the nerves and the, the anxiety is not new. And so they can focus on performing instead of, you know, trying to kill that third entity, the fight in the cage, you know, and they, they can just focus on their opponent. So that's one of the most important things is just get exposure to experience performing in front of a crowd. Um, this is something I see a lot in jujitsu tournaments, like constantly. I, I go to jujitsu tournaments mostly for fun for personal development, like it's, I'm not super competitive about jujitsu. I probably should be more competitive about it, but uh, I'm not super competitive. To me, it's like, this is a fun drill. Like when I go to the gym, you know, take striking out of the equation. So when I compete in jujitsu, I have fun. And when I go to these tournaments, I see people who have not fought before. They've never been punched in the face before. And they are just strung out on adrenaline. They are, they are hyped up with all these nerves. They are scared to death. And they're trying to calm themselves down. And I'm like, this is so interesting. Like, I'm not experiencing this at all. And some of these guys, I see, like, some of these guys are even better grapplers than me. And, and they're way, way more nervous. And I'm like, you don't need to be nervous. Well, you do because you haven't. You haven't conquered the fight yet, if you will. You haven't conquered the third entity yet. Um, but when they do, yeah, it's, they, they, they transform. They become different athletes. They become actual athletes, as opposed to a guy with imposter syndrome feeling like he doesn't belong on the mat or in the cage. It's a very common thing. So that's, that's what I would say about the... Uh, 
how, how many fights? It, it's variable. You know, I've, I've seen guys with zero cage fights who were ready to compete professionally, most of whom had um, amateur wrestling experience. They wrestled in high school and wrestled in college. Um, but for the average person, I would say about 10 amateur fight combat sports experiences, that would be a really smart thing to do before transitioning to professional fighting. But the other part of your question, like, um, could you reiterate, reiterate that? Like, uh, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What kind of gym coach things were, what should we look for in, in our uh, training environment? Was that it? Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, what's the best environment that he should put himself in, uh, environment and even entourage, so that he could succeed mm. in, in pro MMA? You know, in terms of um, gym selection, coach selection, like, you know, like, because a lot, sometimes people have what it takes to succeed. They have the will, they have the discipline, but then they're just, uh, their entourage is all, is all wrong, you know, because yeah. they don't know any better. So they might train at a gym that, you know, that's maybe uh, subpar, so to speak, or they might train yeah. with, uh, you know, like, like, how do you maneuver so that you make the right choices so that you okay. increase your chances of of being a successful pro like whatever that may be uh, you know? that's an awesome question and i'll tell you from my personal experience i did everything wrong in my professional career i did everything wrong and i made every single mistake and i paid for it dearly and because of that because of that i've become the coach that i am today and so if i were to go back in time and give myself this type of advice uh, I suppose here's, here's what I would say. Surround yourself with people that you can trust, that you can trust with your life. And that, that includes your coaches, that includes your training partners, your sparring partners especially. That sparring is such an important thing. And a lot of people do this wrong because they confuse sparring with fighting. And this is how it was when, when I was coming up. Every sparring session was a fight. The sparring sessions were more dangerous than the actual fights. We got hurt way more in the sparring sessions than we did in the fights, and it sucked. And it gave us PTSD. And so I go into these fights um, held back by my sparring instead of advanced by it. I would go into these fights thinking, I don't want what happened in sparring to happen in this fight and I would cringe and I would, I would uh, you know, I would be a shadow of my potential. So it is super important that you, you surround yourself with first with sparring partners that you can trust people that you know, you can spar with without getting injured. People who, who, you know, uh, have your best interest in mind, right? People who, who, you know, want you to progress instead of, you know, just trying to put a notch on their belt, like, yeah, I kicked his butt. Um, it is super important to have a coach who wants you to progress, as opposed to a coach who, who wants to be the center of attention. And, and this, this is a, a big problem with a lot of uh, potential coaches out there. They want to be the center of attention. Um, a lot of people have been asking me lately what I think about... Um, Oh, what's his name? Joshua Fabian, the uh, the coach of um, oh, man, blank on his name. Recently retired UFC fighter um, Diego Sanchez, and I don't know anything about this man personally, and I don't, I don't want to say anything negative about him. Diego Sanchez is a man I respect a lot. He's you know he's proved himself over and over again in in the cage. In the UFC, he's done tremendous things. And recently on the internet, this, uh, you know, these videos have surfaced of, uh, you know, Joshua Fabian and, and uh, Diego Sanchez doing some goofy things together, like hanging upside down and, and uh, Joshua is like punching him in the head and stuff. And like, okay, obviously that's, that's not a training method that people should use. And I don't know why they're doing that, but okay. That's probably not something we should publish because there are people out there who uh, who want to emulate Diego Sanchez and do what he does and train the way he trains and so on and get the results that he got. And 
they're not going to by hanging upside down and having somebody punch them in the head. Okay. But the, the thing that I would criticize uh, Joshua Fabian for is the public appearances that I've seen him, him uh, make where he made it about him instead of about his fighter. Mm. And I, I don't know if you've seen these videos, but, um, but instead of promoting his fighter, instead of saying, um, my guy is a good fighter, this, this is why he's gonna win, this is what he's gonna do, this, this is his moment, it's all about him. It's like, everybody look at me. Right? And that, that, that's problematic. That's, that's not the type of coach I would want in my corner. Um, and again, I'm feeling a little, little remiss. I don't want this to come across as a bagging on, on, on Joshua Fabian uh episode here but um yeah if, if i were to offer some constructive criticism to him i would say you know just um make your focus lifting diego up as opposed to putting yourself in the limelight like if, if you look at if you look at most fighters most people don't know who their coaches are i mean once in a while we'll have a celebrity coach like for Zahabi. people know him because he trained george st pierre and he's got a successful youtube channel um Greg Jackson, you know, people know him because, you know, they, they've talked about him enough in the UFC. He's made enough public appearances and so on that people know his name. But, I mean, name a UFC fighter. Just, just name one off the top of your head. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Israel uh, Adesanya. Okay. Who is this coach? Who is no, his I... main coach? No, I, I don't know either. Name, name another uh, UFC fighter, like uh, on the current cool. UFC roster. Which one? Okay. Uh, no, I was going to say Yoel, but uh, then you said that's currently in the UFC. Um, okay, how about um, uh, Oliveira, Charles Oliveira. He just, he Charles just became... Charles Oliveira. All right, perfect. Who's, who's his head coach? No idea. <laughs> no idea. Okay. And that's, that's the way it, it should be, really. I mean... I, I say that as, as a coach who, you know, I, I depend on, on uh, athletes coming to me for essentially my, my, my paycheck, right? But even so, even though, even though pushing myself into the limelight is profitable for me, that's, that's not what I'm about, right? And what do those coaches do? Why, why are... Um, Israel Adesanya and uh, Ch Charles Oliver. Why were, why are they successful? Because well, how did their ho how did their coaches help them to become successful? By giving them the best opportunities they could to to give them experiences that allowed them to win fights, basically. And that's it. By helping them along the way, not by exalting themselves. And, and putting themselves first. And this, this is a big problem with traditional martial arts versus combat sports. We, we do see it in combat sports, but not as much because the coaches have a vested interest in making sure their athletes win. They have a vested interest in making sure their athletes are better than they ever were, right? Whereas with traditional martial arts, it's, off, it's often about um, essentially worshiping the sensei, worshiping the sifu, worshiping the, the guru, if you will. And everybody defers to his judgment. Everybody defers to his power. Like nobody can show him up. Nobody can be better than the master. Nobody can be better than Bruce Lee in the Church of Jeet Kune Do, for example. Whereas I think, you know, going back to Bruce Lee again, he, I think he would hate that because he, I think he wanted, pe he wanted martial artists to be better than they were. That's what he was all about. He wanted martial arts in general to be better than it was. He, he wanted it to be something um something far beyond what people at his time could have imagined right? and so a a mma coach needs to have the same vision for his fighters he needs to do everything in his power to make sure they are better than he ever could have been um 
as far as an entourage, man. First of all, don't go out of your way and and uh, <laughs> to uh, blow money on on a uh, on a fake entourage, man. I know some fighters have done this. They 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 throw money at, at uh, people trying to trying to look cool. Stop trying to look cool and and just focus on focus on results, man. Be a very results driven person as far as fighting goes. Does it work? Great. Do more of it. Does it not work? Get rid of it. Um, just having a conversation about entourage just the other day with with one of my students, and he brought up I don't remember which fight. No, it wasn't a fighter. It was a basketball, a pro professional NBA player. I don't remember which one, but um, this man is fabulously wealthy, and not just because of his success in the NBA, but because of all these investments and so on that he made. But his entourage was basically he hired his trusted friends that he grew up with to work for him, not to be yes men, but to work for him, to to join his team, and uh, and as a result, he was tremendously successful. So essentially what he did was this formula I'm laying out for you here right now. Surround yourself with people that you can trust, the people you can trust with your success. I, I, I have this experience quite a bit where a fighter will be disillusioned with his current coach or his current gym, and then they will come to me looking for something different. And then they will go away disgruntled because they're getting the same results. And I'll tell you why. Okay. So I had this experience fairly recently. A fighter came to my gym and he's basically like, my other coaches suck. My other team sucks. Let's see what you can do for me. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's see. Let's see how, how you are. And, um, you know, this guy, he's... Uh, I can see right away he's he's kind of a lazy guy who expects the work to be done for him as support as opposed to be putting in the work and he's got a fight coming up in two weeks time and he is essentially asking me make me win with only two weeks of training with you i'm like dude this is not how it works it's not how it works like we need a long period of consistent training to get different results. Okay. And he's like, well, I have a fight in two weeks. Do what you can. I'm like, all right, I'll do what I can. But, you know, the difference between now and two weeks from now is going to be fairly minimal. He didn't like that answer. He goes out. He loses this fight. He gets upset. He leaves, goes on to another gym, has the same exact results, goes on to another gym, and this is not an isolated incident. I see this a lot. So, so a fighter has to take personal ownership. They have, to take, they have to take responsibility for their own actions. They have to take responsibility for their own losses and for their own wins. Now, there are better coaches than others. Like if a coach is having you hang upside down while he punches you in the head, probably not the best coach. Okay? Probably not the best training methods. That's probably a big red flag. Okay. But, um, yeah, there, there are athletes who will succeed regardless of who they train with. Like, you know, Ronda Rousey was competing, for example. A lot of people reamed her coach, and I think, I think a lot of that was, was unfair judgment because, you know, after a lot, Ronda lost a couple of fights, people were like, ha ha, her coach sucks. And, you know, there was that whole, you know, head movement, head movement meme. Um, but Ronda was one of those fighters who I think would have succeeded regardless of who was coaching her, regardless of who she had in her corner. She would have had a similar level of success and a similar level of failure, I believe, regardless of who was coaching her. And I think that's specifically because she was a self-motivated fighter. Um, whereas when you have a guy who feels like 
the coach needs to hold his hand and do everything for him. Uh, that's a guy who needs to work on his own personal personal initiative. So this is this one thing I would I would uh, stress to fighters: make sure you cut the apron strings, become an independent, self motivated man. Okay. A coach is tremendously helpful. A good coach is tremendously helpful. And, uh, you know, when I was, when I was fighting, I didn't, I went in there without a coach. I went in there without corner men. I showed up to fights without a corner man. I was that guy. And I experienced a proportionate level of success to the amount of effort I put into it, which was fairly mediocre. And... If I could go back in time and tell myself something, I would say, get a coach. And I would probably say, well, which coach? And my response would be, go to the closest gym you could find, sign up, get that coach, right? And, and just be committed to the process. And that probably sounds like terrible advice to a lot of people who have a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to pick and choose between gyms, okay, if that's great, go try them out. See which one feels like the best fit for you. Stick to that, right? But, yeah, people are so obsessed with finding the best thing, the best gym, the best coach, the best team. Best is so relative. It's incredibly relative. For some people out there, I'm the best coach for them. And for other people, I might be the absolute worst coach for them, right? For some people out there, you know, you are probably the best martial arts coach for a lot of fighters out there. You might not know it, they might not know it, but you probably have something that will resonate very deeply with a certain set of people that could push them to success in professional mixed martial arts if that's what you wanted to do, okay? And maybe that's, maybe that's not something that interests you. And then for a lot of people, that would not be the case. And you could say the same thing with, uh, you know, Greg Jackson, Faraz Zahabi, you know, they're excellent coaches. I, I um, trained with one, one of Faraz's guys came to train. Uh, he came and trained with, at my gym for a while for about three months. And the dude was awesome. And he was a he was a great athlete and, you know, a phenomenal grappler. And we, you know, we had a lot of train. Uh, we had a lot of fun training with, with the guy. And he was uh, just an absolute testament to the fact that Faraz is a good coach and a good trainer. But is he the best possible coach for everyone? I mean, I think it would be silly to, to, to say that because everybody resonates on different wavelengths with different people. And it's entirely possible. Going back to Joshua, um, Fabia, Fabian, I don't even remember the dude's name. Diego's coach, Diego Sanchez's coach. Maybe, just maybe, they are a good fit for each other. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there's some method behind the mad madness of hanging upside down. I don't know. Not something I would do or recommend anyone. But maybe there's a method to that madness. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. Or maybe cocaine is a hell of a drug, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe Frank Dukes won the Kumite after all. But yeah, the, yeah. the point I'm trying Frank to get Dukes. across is, you know, pick a path and stick to it. Because, you know... Mr. Miyagi from the Karate Kid Part 1. Terrible karate teacher, great life advice, in my opinion. When Daniel LaRusso in that movie was kind of waffling, should I or shouldn't I, Mr. Miyagi gave some great, some great advice. He talks about a, uh, a grape in the middle of the road getting squashed by a car. And he's like, all right, you karate, yes, that okay. You karate, no, that okay. You karate, maybe then squash, just like rape. <laughs> well, you, you ever heard the saying, in the middle is where you get, you know, the most Yeah, F, you know? Indeed. So I'm, so I'm kind of a man of extremes. When, when I find something I'm interested in, I get really interested in it. When I, when I get going on something, I just really get going on it, and I stick to it to the point where where other people are like, you're, you're still doing that thing, right? Why? Because I'm a nerd. That's what nerds do. Nerds are pedantic about the details. Nerds fixate on, on the stuff nobody else cares about. 
That's why martial artists are nerds, right? <laughs> we're, we're the nerds who got beaten up in high school, who got our heads stuck in the toilets, who got stuffed into lockers, who got, you know, just mercilessly reamed by our peers. And so we learned how to fight with this childhood dream. Like if I learn martial arts, I'll be able to fight back in, against the bullies. And because we were such nerds, that's why we get good at martial arts because we fixate on the details because we are people of extremes, right? So you said you want to be a, a world champion in judo. Oh. And I think that is awesome. I have a friend, Matt Grant. I did a, a podcast with him. He is you now a, a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He is a multiple time IBJJF world champion in like the master six and the master seven division. Uh, he started jujitsu. Uh, I think he was 52 years old when he took his first jujitsu class. 52 oh, wow. years old. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, you know, won world titles at blue belt, at purple belt, and also at brown belt. And uh, again, this shocks a lot of people because they assume, you know, I'm I'm over a certain age, so I can't even start. One of the most common questions I'm asked on my channel is, Ramsey, am I too old to start? which I think is a ridiculous question. You know, it, it would make more sense if they were saying, is it reasonable to, to believe that I could become a UFC champion at this age? You know, there's a... Maybe not if you're 50 years old, but... Is it too old to start martial arts? No. Is it too old to set reasonable, accomplishable goals? No. Absolutely not. How often do you get questions like that? Am, am I too old to start? Do you ever hear that sort of thing? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I get a lot of questions like that, like in the comment section, uh, by email. And, you know, the funny thing is uh, I get some of those questions. I would say maybe 10%, 20% are actually from people who are, uh, you know, 40 and over, you know, or in their 50s or 60s. But most of it, most of it are from guys who are like in their 20s. Yeah. And I'm like, yes. well, what do you mean? I'm 42, bro. <laughs> I started at 36. You know, I'm, so like, I, of course, of course it's possible. It's, it's, but you know, I think, I think it's what you said, right? The younger they are, the more they doubt themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that it's just um, people, People in North America, they're, we're not used to seeing people who are older and who are super fit and who are super active. You know, by the time most, like you said, guys, uh, once they finish college and they start working, they have kids, a family, it's over. You know, like 30, 35, they're completely out of shape. And, and then, you know, it's only even more downhill from there until they start, you know, um, getting a bunch of diseases and high blood pressure, cholesterol. So they're not used to that. So for them like 20, like being 30 years old or 25 starting at that age seems to be like too late. Mm. But really it's, it's not, it's not, it, uh -huh. you know, like, of course you're not going to change overnight. It's going to take time, but you know how much time it takes. It's going to be, um, dependent on a lot of factors. Right. But you know, if you want to do something, then, then just, just do it. It's not, it's definitely not impossible. And that's kind of part of my, my thing on YouTube is that, um, you know, on YouTube, I talk about fitness and martial arts. And when I started my channel, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about, but I know it was fitness and martial arts. And then yeah. as, as the channel grew and as I, because, you know, I had a, I had a couple of ups and downs with the channel, uh, meaning I started it and then I kind of quit. I kind of stopped and then I started again, then I stopped and then, Anyways, and then at one point, I really decided to, to give it a go uh, when I finally realized that, you know what, I think I'm going to share my, my journey, um, you know, and, and now that I'm a trainer, then I'm going to talk about training at the same time in my journey uh, about what I want to do. So my thing is that when I was a kid, uh, I watched Bruce Lee, you know, and I was like, holy, holy shit, I want to be like that guy. I yes. want to be the guy that, that kicks ass and, and that's super cool and muscular and all that. And uh, so that's how I started. So I just watched his movies and I was obsessed with Bruce Lee. I was obsessed with ninjas. 
I was except uh, with GI, watching GI Joe Transformers. He Man was amazing. That that was like the ultimate cartoon. You know, he would just scream in the air with his sword and ah, <laughs> and then he, he got, got the power, power right. Yeah, he's like by the power of Grayskull, and then he just goes insane, and then you know he turns his cat into a, a you know a lion and, and everything. So, anyways, I was and I was watching uh, Hulk Hogan pro wrestling, so I was like, man, yeah, I want to be. You know, but Bruce Lee had the biggest impact, so I wanted to be definitely. I want to get into martial arts, and then uh, what happened after that? So then, um, so my parents let me start martial arts when I was thirteen, and I started doing kung fu. So I did uh, Shaolin Hungar kung fu for two years, and it was after two years of learning forms, and got and I got to my purple satch. Uh, then I realized, like, hey, wait a second. I'm not getting, I'm not learning how to fight. I want to, I want to mm-hmm. fight. So then from there, I realized, okay, well, uh, my uncle told me, hey, let's, why don't you try Taekwondo? They do a lot of sparring. So I'm like, okay. So I told my parents, all right, uh, this Kung Fu shit ain't, it's not happening. Uh, let, let's do Taekwondo. Yeah, yeah. So I got myself into Taekwondo and it was sparring. So it was fun. So I thought I knew how to fight all of a sudden because I'm kicking the bag. I'm, I'm, I'm doing light sparring all the time at the club. Uh, you know, like when I mean light, I mean without the uh, the chest protector, you know, just yeah. like we're tapping each other, but we're going relatively fast. But, you know, there's some control. And then from there, um, I wanted to compete and go to the Olympics. I'm like, yeah, this is for me. I'm going to be Olympic champion. Now, the problem with my parents was that, um, well, we came over to, uh, to we came o- we came over to Canada when I was uh, two years old after the Vietnam War. So we were essentially both people. So, you know, them, it was all about survival, giving me and my sister an education, and that was it. And sports was just like something you do for uh, on the side to be healthy. So they didn't want to um, um, invest in me uh, continuing uh, moving up the ranks in Taekwondo because the school where I was at, like you had to pay for every belt promotion. And then the sensei at that time wanted me to get to my black belt as soon as possible because he, he supposedly saw uh, that I had some talent and he wanted me to get to black belt so I could start competing and, you know, obviously represent his school and, and you know, uh, hopefully get some results. So I talked, I talked to my parents about that, but my parents uh, didn't want to invest in that. They're like, no, 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 no. You're just doing this for fun. We're not paying for belt promotions. We're not paying for competitions for nothing. So then at one point, I'm like, that kind of crushed my dreams. And that was a childhood dream of mine to be, uh, to go to the Olympics. So then anyways, fast forward, um, in my twenties and twenties until thirties. So then I didn't, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. I, from 16 to 19, I was doing Taekwondo. And after that, when I realized that, okay, well, there's no future for me in Taekwondo because while well, I, you know, I, uh, my parents aren't going to pay for it. And at that time I was so young. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know anything. So I didn't know that I could, you know, possibly get a job and, and finance myself and figure out a way. Besides, I wasn't allowed to. Like in an Asian family, you're not allowed to. All you had to do is study. That's it. You're not allowed to get a job. I wanted to get a job. They didn't let me. So anyways, so from there, I just kind of, then I started getting bullied in school. Like around, like uh, when I was 13, I was getting bullied in school. And then from there, what happened? Because of that bullying experience, it, it, it left, it, it kind of traumatized me in a way because I, then I really wanted to learn how to fight because I wanted to get back at this bully. Um, so I started getting into to gangs. Mm. You know, like towards when I was 19, 20, I started getting, a, a getting into, a lot, uh, into a lot of uh, gang stuff. And because I felt as though I, I needed to prove myself as a man, I need to, to, to be around people, I need to fight and all that. And so, um, and that eventually led me in my twenties to, uh, become, become a drug dealer, mm. <laughs> kind of a crazy story. So from, from, from 20 until about, uh, 29, I was a drug dealer, you know, and, uh, I wasn't a bad guy. I was just doing bad stuff. <laughs> this actually is that, that uncommon of a story among martial arts that I know. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then after that, I I essentially got um I got busted at one point, so I I I did some time. I went inside for about uh, eighteen months. 
that, that wasn't the first time. It was just the, the, the longest stretch that I ever did. And it was the last yeah. time. So then I got out at the age of 30. And that's when I decided, um, okay, from 30 years old, I got out and I decided not to, to do any of that anymore. So I'm like, okay, well, what am I going to do with my life? Uh, well, okay, I'll just, you know, start, I guess I'll get a job and then I'll try to figure things out from there. And that's what I was trying to do. But at the same time, when I got out, I actually started uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at the age of 30. Mm. And that, that, comp that had a really good impact in my life. And um, funny story too, is that I actually discovered Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when I was in jail. <laughs> I, ha I had, how, yeah. how, okay. how did that go? <laughs> Okay, so I was in um I was in a I was in a cell. I was bunk I was in a cell and it was uh, bunk beds, right? So I had this cellmate and his name, I forgot what his real name was, but uh, his prison name or his street name was Capone. Okay. And Capone was a funny guy. He would he would freestyle rap and stuff like that, and uh, it was kind of annoying. But he made jokes all the time, so we you know we were friends inside. And then from there, at one point, we started. Um, uh, wrestling, because he would always come up to me and say, "Hey, you want you want me to break your you want me to break your face," and I said, "Yeah," I want, and he would always say that jokingly, and then I would shove him, and it would be the end of it. But this time, he was he felt he 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 said that I shoved him, he shoved me back, and he's like, "You want to go?" I'm like, "Yeah, let's go." So then we started wrestling, but it was it was friendly, and he got me into this silly like back then I didn't know what was happening. I thought it was like, "Oh my God, it's it's magic." But essentially, he got he got an underhook, and then he just uh, gable gripped it, and then he pushed down on my shoulder, and he had my head pressed down, and he was kind of on top. I'm not sure how to describe that, but it was a very simple position where he has an underhook. It's over my shoulder, and he's pressing down like that. And I couldn't move because my shoulder was pressed down. So then I asked him, hey, hey, wait, 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 show me that. Like, and he's like, I'm like, well, what is that? What is that you just did? And he's like, oh, man, that's, that's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, man. And he told me, man, you got to do this shit. Like, once you get out of here, man, you do that for three months and you can kick the crap out of anybody. And he's like, I only did it for three months and I, I can manhandle anybody in here. And, and I was like, really? He's like, yeah, man, yeah, man. You, you definitely you got to do that when you get out. That's the shit, you know? So I'm like. So what you're saying is Brazilian jiu-jitsu is good for the streets. <laughs> No, I'm saying Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu might be good for you in a, in a jail cell where there's not a lot of space with somebody who doesn't know anything uh, and who's about your size or smaller. So, so yeah. May, and, <laughs> so, anyways, so, so when I get out of jail, I'm like, okay, fine. Uh, I'm not doing this anymore, so let's try to figure something out. But I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I trained you know, uh, from 30, 30 to 36 in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Then after that, I went over to judo when I was 36. And then at, at the age of, um, so between 30 and, and about 40, that's when, uh, you know, I was, I was um, jumping from job to job, trying to find myself, trying to start different businesses. None of that worked out. And then at one point, I just decided that, you know what, I'm kind of tired of this, running after money, running after something that's, you know, I'm just going to do what I enjoy doing. So I'm going to uh, live in a gym because I like working out. And I like to train martial arts. So that's what I'm going to do. So the way I'm going to do that is to pay my bills is to go work at a gym and become a trainer. Might as well. So that's what I did. And then from there, I also realized that, wait a second. Why not? And then when I started judo, I started competing. And uh, when I was doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I, I competed, but I never had good success there. Only towards the last competition that I did that I actually, I didn't even win, but I actually performed well, despite uh, having lost. You know, you know how it is sometimes you perform, you did, your performance yeah. was good, you're really happy about it, but you still lost because the guy was just better than you. But you weren't, yeah. you weren't ashamed of, 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 of your performance, so to, so to speak, right? Yes. So uh, Those are interesting moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a very interesting moment. And that, I remember my coach at that time in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, he told me that right there, that fight, now you're a real competitor. Everything else prior to that, like the 10 other competitions you did, that was just you like going, going through the motions and, and learning.
But then after that, I stopped because I essentially switched clubs. But then after that, when I switched clubs, I switched BJJ clubs. Uh, I didn't compete anymore because I didn't feel like it because it was expensive also. BJJ competitions are expensive compared yeah, to judo. They are, man. Exactly. Yeah, man. There's, a, there's a jiu-jitsu competition coming up next month. And I'm, I want to do it, but it's also like it's like $100 US just to sign up for the thing. And I'm like... Do I really want to, though? Uh, what else could I spend that money on? Hmm. But yeah, man. Well, at that, at that price, you, you could do like two or three, two, three judo competitions if you, you know? Yeah. And at the same time, coming from a, um, after having been paid to compete, paying to compete just doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It's weird. It's like, no, I'm putting myself at risk. I, I deserve monetary compensation. That's how, that's how fighting works in my mind, you know? But, uh, yeah, paying to, paying to compete is weird. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I could understand that perfectly. So, to just, just so I could wrap up the story, right? And so, when I, when I switched over to judo, that's when I started... Uh, uh, my coach said, listen, you, you should compete. I'm like, depends. How much is it? He told me, well, it's like 20 bucks a competition. And I'm like, 20 bucks? For 20 bucks, I'll do all the, all the damn competitions year-round. <laughs> you know, because that, that was the limiting factor for me in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It was so expensive. Uh, yeah. You know, like, you would literally have to get, like, a, a part-time job just to, you know, just to pay for competitions and expenses and hotels and all that. So I'm like, yeah. okay, for judo, at 20 bucks a pop? Yeah, let's go. So I started competing in judo. First season was a disaster because I couldn't get over um, the fight, like you, you talked about, the, the, the anxiety of it all. Yes. But then my coaches, they saw that, and they told me, well, listen, you're not performing the way you perform in the club. So you're probably just nervous. What we're going to do is you're going to do every single competition for the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And then, and then I started winning. So, so now I started winning and I found my groove. So me, everybody, every, every fighter is different about regarding their mindset, how they prepare for it, how they think about it and all that. But me, like the mindset that works for me. And I tried, a, I tried a couple, I tried being the hyping myself up and being the ultra aggressive guy that's going to come in there and rip the guy's head off. And I'm, I'm a killer and you know, blah, blah, blah. That didn't work. And then I tried, okay, maybe. Maybe if I come in and I'm, I'm ultra relaxed and I don't take it seriously and, you know, I'm just there for fun. That didn't work out either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, so then finally, I, I, after, after competing and doing it over and over, I, came, I got so desensitized to the fight because you come in, like, I, you walk, like the first time you walk on a, a, I know it's only judo, but you walk onto the mats, it's a big competition, you see like a couple of hundred guys, man, yeah. running around, you know, like they take a whole surface area, like half of the space is taken up just for the warmups for, you know, okay, this is the adults are fighting now. We're going to warm up. So it's a group warm up. You see all the judo guys like on the mat, they start running around, they start warming up and stuff like that. And it's, it's intimidating, you know, the lights, the flash, the, the, the refs and all that. Uh, but then after a while, you get so desensitized to that because at one point I was just going there and I'm like, okay. It's the same thing over and over again. So I was even uh, taking naps like in between my fights, you know, <laughs> literally taking naps. I had my, I brought my, um, my sleeping bag and I, I would literally eat and take naps until it was my turn. And then my coaches would come and kick me and, Hey, it's your turn. Get dressed, get warmed up. It's, it's time to go. I'm like, Oh, okay. So anyways, I started performing. You gotta, you so gotta watch out for the guys who, who can sleep before a fight, man. <laughs> Those are some scary dudes. Yeah, yeah, and um, so 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 I got to the point where okay, now now I, I don't have that anxiety anymore because it's just another competition, whatever, no big deal. And the mindset that worked for me at this point, I feel no, um, I don't feel anxiety, I don't feel any fear. I'm really out there to have fun. I get excited now, and in my mind, it's about okay, this is where I get to showcase like that I what I'm about and I'm going to kick this guy's butt, but it's a very, it's excited. I'm excited, but I'm focused, but yeah. I'm, I'm there to show off. If that makes any sense. 
No, that, that absolutely makes sense. Like nervousness and, and excitement are almost the same emotion. They're almost. It's just they're they're translated so very differently in the mind. So it's it's like we, we have to get to the point where we can choose to be excited instead of nervous. Oh yeah, yeah, because it's this is this is the fun part. Like to me now, um I chose excitement because I've noticed that I I I, I perform my best when I'm excited. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh I'm gonna beat this dude up. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show him what's what's real judo, you know, or whatever, you know. And I'm gonna, and I'm, I'm focused, you know. I'm not nervous, so it keeps me at a at a place where I'm, I'm on, but not too on. I'm not overly aggressive or anything like that. I'm just there. To, I'm focused. I'm there to win, but I'm having a lot of fun. So it, and yeah. for me, it works. It works tremendously well. And um, in the big scheme of things, it's just a competition. Who cares? Be honest yeah. you know so whether you whether i win or lose it doesn't matter obviously i'm gonna play to win but if i lose i mean i've, I've lost so much my whole life and at the same yeah. time during all those previous matches and competitions until i finally got the hang of it that to me losing is actually no big deal because i, I i've done more losing than winning but now i'm starting to win and now my coaches are telling me like he's starting to to tell me like hey listen like the way you're going about it the way you're training like you really have uh, the potential to be a somebody in the judo world in Montreal, and you could you could win against guys like in your division, like if you keep training. And that's where I started thinking about it and thinking about it. And then I'm like, wait a second, this is what I wanted when I was a kid. I wanted to go to the Olympics. I wanted to be a world champion or a, or Olympic champion in a combat sport. You know. So I'm yeah. like, well, what's stopping me now? So I thought about it, and I'm like. Uh -huh shit let's do it let's go you know so here so my channel now is really about when, when i'm on my channel i tell I, t I talk to my community and i'm always like this is what i'm about like me i like to i like to train and the training is really to supplement my uh my judo and i'm 42 and i'm going after my childhood dream at this point and i'm gonna go win a, a world title and, yeah. and that's so, so, you know, I want people to like come and uh, hang out with me and see the journey. So I'm going to share that on YouTube. So that's my whole thing. And to show people that it's possible to be at a very high level, even at, at 42. Right. So I still have to get the black belt now because of COVID things are closed, you know, yeah. or, I would, or else I would have gotten it by now, I believe. Um, but when things open up again, get the black belt. And after that, just compete until, uh, until I get that, uh, until I get that world title. And also, I have to find a way to make it work because the thing is, um, it's not like I'm on the national team or anything. I got to, you know, essentially fund myself. So that's where it gets a little bit, um, I wouldn't say tricky, but that's what I'm working towards is essentially my only goal. But the only reason I actually want to make money in life at this point is so I could train and compete. <laughs> All right. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really care about anything else, you know, like it's like I don't, I don't have any kids, like I have a dog, I have a wife and all uh, that, that's, you know, and, and I love them, of course, but I don't care about anything else. Money doesn't matter to me, like whether I'm rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Like the only reason I want money, it's not to be just to have money for money's sake. It's about me getting a world title. Yeah, it, it is super about. important to define your priorities like that. And that, that, that's another thing I, I would go back and tell my my younger self: define your priorities and set some goals and set lofty goals. Like that's a lofty goal. Be be a world champion in your sport, right? And that's one of those things that the average person thinks that's not attainable. Whatever, that's a pipe dream. Set lofty goals. When I started out, when I started competing, I told myself, "Well, I just did it for the money. Like I I just needed." In a great twist of irony, I started fighting professionally to pay medical bills because healthcare is ridiculous in America and um, couldn't afford it. And I, I had um, I had medical bills to pay, and I needed an extra fifty dollars every month just to make that minimum payment. And I was working three jobs, and the only way I could think of to make an extra fifty bucks every month was prize fighting. And so I started kickboxing and all that, and uh, then MMA and Muay Thai. And my only goal was survive, don't get injured badly enough where I'm going to compound my medical bills and get that paycheck, and, and um, that's it. 
if I could go back in time, I would tell myself, you know, set some loftier goals. Set a goal to get into the UFC, which I would have laughed at myself for. I would have been like, ah, that's a, no, I'm, I'm not that guy. I'm not good enough for that. But I would, co- I would go back in time and tell myself, so what? Set a lofty goal. Because you will never, ever accomplish anything greater than the goals that you set. So I love the fact that what, what you brought up about, about losing, it is super important for us to learn to lose, not to be losers, but to learn to lose, right? So that we're not afraid of it. Because that's something that holds competitors back in every sport, the fear of losing. Because fear is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is. What, what you are afraid of the most will happen to you. For example, if you're afraid of spiders, you will run into spiders all the time and they will scare you all the time and you will live in fear of spiders all the time. Right? If you're not afraid of spiders, you won't really notice them. Even if they're crawling on the wall, you won't notice them. Because they're not a big deal. They don't, they don't scare you, right? And if you're afraid of losing, what's going to happen? Oh, man, those losses, you know, even if you win most of the time, those losses will haunt you, right? But if you're not afraid of it and you focus on the success, that's what you're going to experience most of the time. That's been my experience anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, but that makes perfect sense, you know, because what um, what you focus on, you know, for for extended periods of time, that's what's going to find find a way to manifest itself in, into your life, right? So if you're you know if yeah. you're afraid of fear, if if you're if you're afraid of failure or you're afraid of losing, and that's all you could think about, well, th- that's gonna reflect in the way you perform on the type of decisions you do you you make like during during that uh, during that fight or during that match, you know. So confidence is 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 a big thing. It's like you, you need to, and I think that confidence comes from, I think the best way I would describe how to get that confidence is through clarity. Hmm. So what does clarity look like to me? Clarity comes from, well, practice, putting in the work and, and having done, having been in those uncomfortable situations so many times that you know you could get out of it. You know you can handle it. And, and, you know, that, that comes down to when we're talking about drilling and drilling certain sequences and then making it uh, progressively harder each time and then breaking it up and then using the whole sequence and, and so on and so on. And, yeah, I think that if you spend enough time in uncomfortable situations and you have that confidence, that clarity, that you know exactly what to do when you're in that position uh, to get out of it so you're confident, then after that... Um, Got where I was going with this, but I was talking about confidence. I was talking yes. about clarity, clarity, confidence, and then yeah. So when you have that confidence afterwards, like you have to, um, you got to nurture it, and you have to essentially be very aware of what's going on in your mind, and and that's the hardest thing for 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 us as humans because we are, are we have monkey brains. It just goes all over the place. Like if I tell you right now, Ramsey, whatever you do, don't think of monkeys. <laughs> And if you don't think of monkeys, I'll give you a million bucks. It's too late, man. It's too late. I'm remembering this awesome YouTube video I saw once of monkeys doing flying jump kicks and knocking people off of scooters. <laughs> it was incredible. I can't find it anymore, but it was. I wish I could. It's the most amazing YouTube video. Monkeys doing flying side kicks and knocking people off of their bikes. It's like oh, a yeah, whole think- compilation of it. But you're talking about real monkeys or like real uh, monkeys, uh, real live monkeys, like. Um, what what is the uh, bike equivalent of carjacking? Like bike jacking people, like stealing people's bikes after knocking them off. Monkeys can be brutal, man. There there used to be a lot of monkey handlers on on the street that I live on here in Shanghai, here on on Wujang Road. It's um, there used to be these uh, like panhandlers with monkeys that would be trained and do tricks and stuff and. And uh, people would give them money and the monkeys would go over and take the coins out of their hands. And people would be like, oh, it's so cute. But one of these monkeys, there was this one monkey and it was missing its tail. And this monkey was the meanest monkey on the block. And so my wife and I, this is the first time we meet the, the tailless monkey. And uh, 
she wants to give it a peanut. She's like, here, little monkey, have a peanut. The monkey comes up, grabs the peanut out of her hand, slaps her across the face, and then runs away. And my no wife way. has his breath. Yes, she's like, did the monkey just slap me? I'm like, yes, you just got slapped by a monkey. So every time we see the tailless monkey, we're like, stay away from that thing. Um, anyway, monkeys, oh, can, they've got attitudes, some of them. And they, some monkeys don't like people. Well, that one, that one, like, probably got his uh, his tail chopped off by, you know, some human or something like that. I'm guessing probably. maybe that's why he has such a big attitude. Probably. Yeah, oh. so, you see, so so now if you were to tell yourself, okay, don't think about a monkey. No, you're trying not to think, of, but just the fact that you're trying not to think of a monkey, you're thinking of a monkey. So that's that's why trying to think of, of not losing is actually going to increase your chances of losing. Then if yeah. you just uh. play, you got to replace it with, you know, like, I'm going to win with confidence, but with confidence, for confidence to arise, to be there in a real way, you have to have clarity. Because confidence without clarity is just you're just you're just being delusional. You're just yeah. you know hyping yourself and 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 it's just false bravado. Yeah. It's like oh yeah, I'm the toughest man on the planet. Yeah, uh, uh, I'll just let him punch me a couple of times. Is competence right? Those two words are interconnected. If we are not competent, we we can't actually be confident. I think I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about losing a fight like um. I get challenged to fights on the internet like every day. People send me messages and emails and, and uh, just all, all kinds of messages challenging me to like fights, Come, uh, just telling me how, how badly they would beat me up. And, and sometimes, sometimes I read these and I think, what, what would actually happen if I showed up to this fight? And occasionally, occasionally these guys will have videos of themselves fighting and most of them are just absolute jokes, but I think to myself, what would happen if, if I fought this guy? And I, I started asking myself these questions. Well, if I lost, how would I lose? And I think that's a super important question for combat sports athletes to ask themselves when they are nervous. If I lost, how would I lose? Because I think y you know how you would lose. Like if your grappling sucks, you're probably going to be exploited by a superior grappler. If you don't know how to box, you're probably going to get knocked out by the guy who does, and so on. So, so what that tells you is how you need to improve. If, if, you can, if you have this fear of losing, it's because you know how you're going to lose. And so because of that, we know how to become competent enough so that we don't, so that we can gain the confidence that we can actually win. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that word even better than, than clarity. It, you know, it come like confidence comes from competence, and confidence, well, you know, it can only gain. It can only be gained through practice, right? Practice, 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 and that's where you get that confidence, and that's where that's where it becomes confidence. And then from there, um, I wouldn't say that you have that um, <clears throat> invincible mindset, so to speak, but you know that. Anywhere the fight goes, like you'll be, you'll be fine. And then, of course, you're gonna try to dictate and, and come up with strategies and tactics to take the fight where you want to go to exploit the other's weakness and all that. Uh, that's great. But um, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's something. Uh, I forgot where how the conversation started, but uh, oh yeah, you were talking about how losing. It's important to know um, to know how to lose. I think. Yeah. And it you just and also on. how you're going to lose. I mean. Think about this, like think about your training partners, like your best training partners, like the guys who can beat you when when you uh, train, the guys who can throw you any way they want, um, the guys who can pin you, the guys who can submit you, right? Think about one, one of these guys, and when you're going to train with him, do you ever think to yourself like, oh man, he's, he's probably going to beat me and he's probably going to do it with, with this move? or that move, or this strategy. Does that, does that thought process ever happen? 100%. I got a guy right here, right now. This guy, I noticed that um, when I fight him, I'm always worried, because I know he has like, this is what he does to me, this is what, he, you know, this is the couple of things that he does to me all the time, and he yeah. does it when he wants to. And, and so, 
because of that, I always have this fear of attack of, of, of putting on, of going for it a hundred percent in my attacks, mm -hmm. you know? And then when I, when I do that, because I hesitate, I go half, I'm halfway in, but then I stop. Then from there, he counters me. Yeah. But then, I, and he even told me that he's like, cause I asked him, Hey man, like I have a really hard time. I'm always, you know, like, what do you, what do you think is, is wrong with my judo? This guy used to be on the national team and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's, uh, He's at, he's what 170, 170 pounds, but like all muscle. He has like no fat on him yet, you know, and super yeah. exclusive. One of those athletes. And he told me, well, the problem with you, he told me, and he was referring to me. The problem with you is that you come in half, like you, you come in halfway. You come in with not a hundred percent. And he said, if you do that to me, I could feel it. So if you stop halfway through your movement, or even like even. 70% through your movement, you're, you're going three quarters of the way, let's say, but then you hesitate, you're screwed because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel it and I'm going to counter you right there on the spot. And that's what's happening to you. So just he said, you have to go the 100. Karate make it wash just my grape. Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the grape. And that's it. So I'm the grape with this guy. And, and he told me with me, you got to go 100%. So I, I, so I won't be able to counter you. Worst case, you miss, and then you reset again, or you just follow up with another attack. But if you half-ass it, I'm going to get you. And that's what's happening with you. So he said, you know, so now it's, uh, it's still a mental block that, I, uh, that I'm working on for, for this particular guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this guy, this guy really, like, uh, there's two guys on my clubs who... Who, who had this effect on me and I'm still working on it. Right. Because these uh, guys are a couple but isn't of steps. That interesting. Uh, like before you even, before you even, um, get on the mat with them, you know, exactly how they would beat you. Right. Like they're not going to surprise you with how they beat you. Are they, they're not going to pull out some crazy flying triple upside down move. You've never seen before. They're probably oh, going to no. use a strategy that you've, you've already succumbed to. Right. It's the same three, four techniques he does on me all the time. All the time. It's just yeah. that, you know, it, it's not like he's doing any magic tricks or anything like that. Like, okay, the first time I fought, first couple of times I fought him, like I didn't know what his uh, usual attacks are, but now I know. So that's the thing. Even when you know, but because yeah. you have this, you know, he's, he's, because he's done it to you so many times, you think that it's going to be like that again. And because of that self, self-defeating uh, belief, if, yeah. uh, you know, then yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. I, I had this experience with a, this experience with one of my training partners, my, my friend Carlos. He's a, he's a jujitsu brown belt and he's got this death grip on his right hand where if he gets a hold of your lapel, he can just do horrible things to you. And I noticed <laughs> something. Every time he grabbed my lapel with his right hand, my, my left lapel with his right hand, he would always do the same thing. And so at first I felt that like sense of dread every time it was time to grapple with Carlos. And I was like, oh man, he's going to grab me with his death grip with his right hand and he's going to get that lapel and he's going to do that thing again. But then I had this thought one day, what if I grab his right hand before he can grab my lapel? <laughs> and so I tried it and I grabbed his right hand and then I'm able to arm drag him. I'm like, whoa, that happened differently this time. So for for a while i kept thinking i kept envisioning me losing the same way if you will like he's going to grab the lapel he's going to do the thing and then i'm going to lose he's going to grab the lapel he's going to do the thing then i'm going to lose but when we can addre address the root of the problem like you know if the problem is just that right hand that right hand is the big enemy if we can find a way to neutralize that and build in an offensive strategy around that and as your training partner point out don't approach it halfway, but go all in. We can find a way around that. Now, not saying that's going to be easy, but uh, and they're going to adapt around your adaptation, which is what forces growth, of course, because eventually you'll, you'll figure out a way to you know beat this guy to the punch, if you will, and then he's going to figure out a way to compensate for it the way you compensated for his strategy. And he's going to build a new strategy. Then you're going to have to build a new one, right? And it goes back and forth. And it's an amazing process. 
All right, because as oh, soon yeah. as I arm dragged my friend Carlos, what did he do? He adapted his game plan. So when I tried arm dragging again, he adapted, right? And so I had to come up with a new strategy. I'm going to attack him on the other side, you know. And then suddenly he's defending both sides. And then, you know, you, it just becomes more complex, right? Yeah, because absolutely. We have to. But it's a beautiful thing because when we fight somebody new, somebody that has not adapted to us, suddenly we're the better fighter in that situation because we've been through all of those possible scenarios. And so they don't surprise us. Yeah, and so instead yeah, of just focusing on how we're going to lose, we can then focus on how we're going to win. Exactly. And you know, like, this makes me think of something my first judo coach told me. He told me the mark of a, of a real black belt is that when you, when you spar with him, um, you'll catch him once with something. Yeah. But then you won't be able to catch him a second time with mm. that same technique. And that's, the, that's a mark of a, really, of a very good black belt, is that you might catch him one time with one particular throw, but then you'll go to round two. If you try that move again, he'll, he'll be able to, to stop you. He won't fall for it. He'll be able to get out of it or counter you or, you know, like shut you down. And he said, that's when you know you're, you're, you're in front of a real advanced black belt. Like he's able to make the adjustments um, quickly, you know, not, not during the match, so to speak. But I mean, if he experiences it, he experiences it once, he'll know what to, he'll, he'll know what to watch out for uh, after that. But that's really interesting. And of course, as he makes the adjustments, then you have to make the adjustments because what worked the first time isn't going to work again. So you're going to have to set it up differently. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very beautiful thing. So there's, there's levels to the game. And, you know, black belt is really just um, the beginning. Like the way my coach used to describe it to me is that in judo, once you get to, uh, once you get to black belt, that's when you're finally with the big boys. It's just yeah. the beginning. It doesn't mean you mastered anything. It just means now you get to play with the big boys. That's it. This is a topic I want to talk about a little bit because I think, because I, I, I totally understand that. And I, I think because, because of the language that we use to express that idea, some people get the wrong idea that a black belt doesn't mean anything. Or that a black belt, um, the, basically black belts should not be good at fighting or, or good at their martial art. And um, because, again, it, it, it's, it's like that first level. Now you're playing with the big boys, if you will. But um, I get a ton of derogatory comments from martial artists who essentially tell me that, um, that a black belt in any given martial art just means you have a super basic low level of competency. And... I, I hate this idea because if, if you go back to the origins of the black belt, uh, Jigoro Kano gave out two ranks originally, the black belt and the white belt, black belt to instructors and white belt to students. And supposedly the instructors knew judo and they knew how to teach it, right? And then other martial arts like Taekwondo adopted the black belt and karate adopted the belt, the belt system as well. And all these other martial arts now use belt systems because judo did and they thought it was cool and it looked legit. And people like tying rank belts around their, around their waists. But there are so many crappy martial artists out there wearing black belts who use this as an excuse saying, well, the black belt is just the first level. It's, it's just a basic level of competency. And I'm like, you, you don't even know the forms of your martial. You don't even know how to throw a punch. You don't even know how to make a fist. That, that's not a basic level of competency. Um, I don't know how many terrible black belts in various martial arts you've met. I've met a lot. And... Uh, and I think the reason for this is just not because martial arts are inherently good or bad, but because most people just kind of suck at martial arts. Because most people haven't put in the work and the effort to gain competency in martial arts. Like, people are always arguing on the internet, like, 
whether or not Aikido is good or not, whether or not Krav Maga is good or not. And I have made some videos to this effect where people ask me my opinion, and I told them quite frankly my, my opinion. This is the experience I have had with instructors and black belts in these martial arts and so on. And people get mad because my experience with most martial artists of most disciplines is they are they're not serious fighters. And this is true of almost everybody. Um, and people get mad because they, they feel that's a, a reflection on their style, which, which they identify with, identify coming from the Latin idem, meaning the same as, I, I, I make myself the same as, that's what identify means. So if I identify with Aikido, for example, and some guy on the internet says Aikido sucks, therefore is saying you suck as a person, right? And people get mad about this. They become tribal over these martial arts. So I'm, I'm expressing like three or four points at the same time here, but, but I loved how you phrased that, that the black belt in, in judo, it, it doesn't mean you're a master. It means you're playing with the big boys now, if you will. I, I love that. I love that, how you phrased that. Because, I mean, you can be, you can be good you can be a good grappler without an advanced judo rag. Like I've, I've met many people who were. And uh, again, as we discussed before, I've met many uh, judo black belts of dubious level of, of skill. And I've met guys who were just absolute killers. Um, how do you feel about, about belt inflation, if you will, about... Um, you know, people who suck having black belts in martial arts versus people who are amazing at martial arts having the same exact rank. Hmm. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> wait, could you, could, you, could you repeat that question? I mean, how do I feel yeah. about people who have black belts and who suck, who can't fight? And yes. about people who have black belts and who can't fight? People with the same exact rank who, who can fight. Like, um, Mm, mm. Okay. Well, the thing is, um, if you get your black belt and um, you haven't sparred, there's no sparring in, in, in your martial art, or you just didn't spar, then you're going to get, and you get the black belt regardless because of time spent, you know, you're devoted, you know, you're, you're really a student of the game, but you just don't like to fight or whatever, then of course, yeah, you won't be able to fight. It's because you only get good at what you do, what you practice. Yeah. So if you practice doing forms or you practice, uh, you know, like um, uh, you practice a lot of um, drills, so to speak, but you don't actually fight, then you're not going to get good at fighting. You'll get good at whatever it is that you're training at. So, if, for example, in Wing Chun, if you do a lot of sticky hands and and you go like this and you go like that and you, you work a lot on the dummy, that's what you're going to get good at. But you don't actually get good at fighting because fighting is – the only way to get good at fighting is to fight. And, and so in the martial arts where they don't have sparring, but guys have trained for a, for a long time and they get their black belt, and then from there – and that, I think that's where it comes from. They're like, okay, well, now that I have um, basic competence in, you know, in my art, I have a black belt, but I still can't fight because now it's the beginning. Well, that's mm. because you, you never fought. <laughs> For whatever reason, your club like didn't allow sparring, or it was very uh, it was very um, delusional type of sparring. You know, like mm. they just go at it, but they don't really go at it. Like they're both people are um, ultra predictable in, in in what they're doing. You know, I, I'm kind of talking about like sticky hands and, 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 you know, those Wing Chun drills where they're going back and forth with your hands. Like, da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 da. like yeah, okay, well, whatever. Such That's a what cooperative drill. It would be like if, if all you did in Jiu Jitsu was, you know, cooperative uh, sequences, right? Without ever, um, you know, sparring or, or even, even just drilling at a higher level, right? Mm -hmm. And then you would get really good at essentially doing contact modern dance improvisation as opposed to not even improvisation you get really good at, at doing sequences and that's it right yeah so then, here's the what, here, here like if you really want to boil it down to the essence like i'm thinking if you don't get if you don't punch somebody in the face and get punched in the face or get kicked or kick somebody in the head and you and, and you get kicked in the face then guess what 
that means that you can't fight. It's as simple as that. And for judo, if you haven't thrown anybody or gotten thrown or gotten choked out or gotten arm barred or done it, if you haven't had it done to you and you haven't done it to anybody else, then you can't fight. It's as simple as that. But me, in, from coming from where, for, uh, where I'm coming from, like I'm, I'm, I'm brown belt currently, but I've been fighting all this time. I've been competing and I've been doing my randories like at the club and then going out and competing. So by the time I get to my black belt, like I have a really, uh, I got really strong fundamentals in fighting for my sport <clears throat> and like in technique. So that's why now I'm, I'm with the big boys. Now I'm like, okay, now the gloves come off. Now we could really play and, and evolve and focus and, and, and narrow down our techniques and specialize and do all kinds of, of, uh, of, of great things and keep on evolving. But for somebody who uh, practices any, in, any type of martial art, if you haven't, in my opinion, if, if you haven't punched people in the head and, you know, and vice versa, yeah, and, and if you haven't kicked anybody in the head and vice versa, you haven't thrown anybody or, and vice versa, or you haven't gotten choked out or joint locked and vice versa, then essentially, yeah, you, you don't know how to fight, unfortunately. Yeah, man, exactly. But how many martial arts are there out there? And uh, you know, including, including Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, there's a bunch of hippy-dippy nonsense in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, to be honest. Like yeah. all these um, upside-down, spinning, wh whatever nonsense moves that look really cool if you're looking through an Instagram feed and it's a oh, hashtag jiu-jitsu, oh, look at that helicopter spinning de la worm, whatever it is, right? And it looks cool. But the question is, has anybody ever actually done that in a fight? And the answer is usually no. Or I knew a guy who could do it once. But yeah, if um but I hear this constantly from uh from you know, martial artists, because they're always giving me feedback, especially on my videos where they ask, is this effective? And if my answer is, in my experience, no, they get mad, of course, because uh, they, they, they want to believe that they'll tell me this is part of my system. My sensei taught me this move. And therefore, therefore, because I identify with it, because it's part of my tribe, I have to defend it to the death. Right. And then I'll ask them. Have you ever done this in a fight? Have you ever done this against a resisting opponent? Have you ever done this in a sparring session against somebody um, who wasn't cooperating? And the answer, the honest answer is almost always no. In that case, well, then it doesn't work. Not for you anyway. Maybe for that one guy who is uh, really strong and really big. And yeah, man. I mean, the thing about wrist locks, for example, wrist locks are, I use wrist locks, I like wrist locks, I get caught in wrist locks from time to time when grappling, but I think a lot of people like to romanticize them. And we'll see this a lot with um, angry Aikido practitioners of the internet. I'm going to pick on them for a minute because specifically because they send me a lot of angry messages. I don't have anything against Aikido, to be honest. I think there are a lot of beautiful Aikido techniques that I actually use myself but um they, they get mad and they will tell me things like i totally use this technique look here's a video and then they'll show a video and they're like a 300 pound just jacked bouncer type of guy picking on little skinny dudes <laughs> and risk talking essentially child-sized people i'm like well of course one thing people don't understand about, understand about wrist locks is that to control somebody with a wrist lock, either one, you've got to pin them and gain superior position, which is how it's generally done in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or two, you've got to have great physical strength to an imposing level. Uh, or three, you have to take somebody completely by surprise who has no, no idea what a wrist lock is. So that's, yeah. that's been, yeah, that has been my experience anyway. I know people hate my experience, but that's my experience. I, I mean, I, I've invested my life into training and martial arts and trying to find the most, the highest reward, lowest risk techniques. And 
not every te technique is at, a, at the same level. It's not. I mean, some techniques look cool. Everybody, I mean, everybody knows this, but not everybody wants to admit it. Some techniques look cool. Some techniques give you style points, if you will, or what that's worth in a fight, which is nothing. Um, but the high percentage stuff is always going to be the high percentage stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. And it's funny that you mentioned uh, where, that you talk about wrist locks, and I agree 100% with those three things that you said, which is either you're ultra strong relative to the other guy, you cut him off guard, or you got a positional advantage, and okay, now you can crank that lock. But, I mean, for the most part, like, it's, it's not a high percentage thing. Like, how often are you going to be able to do that in an actual fight? And, like, it depends on the context, too. Like, what, what exactly is going on? And so, yeah, so wrist locks to me, it's like, yeah, you could, like you said, like, you get caught in it every once in a while, right? Because either uh, you got caught, caught off guard and the guy just was strong enough to pull it off on you, you know, because you're not a small guy. You're six, uh, how tall are you? Six uh, that, one. Six one? And six how much you weigh? About, uh, in pounds, about 205 pounds right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're not. Uh, you're, you're not. You're not big. At, I mean, sorry. You're not I'm, small. I'm not enough. tiny. I'm not tiny. Yeah. So I mean, for somebody to pull that 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 crap on you, like they must have been either really strong, caught you off guard, or they were in a position where uh, they had a dominant position on you, and then they were able to pull it off, right? And and yeah. So, but I mean, for for most people, like getting like. A lot of martial art nerds, first of all, you're not that strong. Most of these guys aren't that strong because these nerds yeah. usually don't even lift weights, unfortunately, right? Uh, because, yeah. you know, they might have that belief that weights slow you down. So they don't lift weights, so they're not strong. And then from there, well, <clears throat> um, they don't actually have, like, the skill set to actually get to a dominant position to pull off the wrist lock because they don't actually train fighting. So the only time they would actually be able to pull it off is if they catch a sucker by surprise, yeah. you know, and, and somebody who's relatively weaker than them and who doesn't know anything. So, I mean, that's the only time they would actually pull it off. So it's a very, uh, but for the most, most of the time they're going to get that technique is not going to work for them. That's something that they, they probably, um, maybe should consider. And, Speaking of, of, of wrist locks, you know how, uh, you know Rokas, right? Like you did a, you did a yes. podcast with him, Martial Arts Journey. Yes. So he goes on, uh, he goes on now and, and I, I love it because he's beefing, you know, he, he went 180, right? He was like the Aikido guy, believed in it, has his own school and everything. And then at one point he got, uh, uh, is yeah. that the right word? Dis disillusioned? Right? Yes. He, yeah, he got disillusioned and then he, he went out and he tested it and Blah, 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 blah. And he tried, I think, for a while to figure out, like, to try to make Aikido work because he, he invested the so old much time. Try, man. And mm -hmm. I, I went through the, the same process with, uh, with many of the martial arts systems that, I, that I've studied over the years, man. Uh, that, it's such an important journey for, for everybody to do. But, yeah, go on. Yeah, so, so now he's, he's um, you know, he's, he's, he's talking about his journey. He's speaking his truth how we see things, and he's also challenging uh, the Aikido community to essentially send them videos. Like, if they want to argue with him, they have to send them video proof that, you know, um, that it works. So there was a guy, I, I found on a video, um, I think it was today or yesterday, this guy, he was called Dan Wolfman, I believe, and he posted a video. I don't know if Rokas saw it yet, but he, he tagged Rokas in it, right? to show him yeah. that wrist locks actually work. So this guy is an MMA guy. Oh, he does MMA. In the video, you see him in a cage uh, fighting. And what he did is that he, 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 had this, he had his opponent in the clinch. And he was giving, and so he was clinch, he, was, uh, he had his opponent in the clinch, he was kneeing him to death. He was giving him a couple of knees. And because uh, his opponent had his hands like, you know, uh, over him like that, and he had, him, he had inside grip, clinching him up like this. So then at one point he slipped, he slipped off to the side, he grabbed the guy's wrist and then wrist locked him and uh, pivoted at the same time, like Aikido style and, and brought him yeah. to the ground. And then, you know, I guess his uh, argument there is that, look, it does work, you know, but um, even though he was able to pull it off, like, I think 
I don't know. What's what's your opinion on that? Like, I know you didn't see the video yet. But I didn't see the video, but yeah, there's definitely some other factors at play. I mean, this guy is a professional MMA fighter. Obviously, he's athletic. He's strong. And he's also, as you mentioned, kneeing the guy to death first. There, there was a, a fight a while back. Was it Rodolfo Vieira? Um, you know, legendary jiu-jitsu competitor. He's, he has an MMA fight. And he loses. And the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, he loses by submission to a, a guy who's like a blue belt or a purple belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And Rodolfo Vieira is a legendary black belt. And the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community lost their mind over this. Like, how could a how could a blue belt or a purple belt beat one of the best black belts? It's impossible. We don't understand it. Our minds are blowing. So, so I watched this fight. And basically what happened, here's the play-by-play. -play. The, the blue belt or purple belt. I'm, I'm just going to call him a blue belt. I don't remember his name. The blue belt punches Vieira in the head, then kicks him in the head, then elbows him in the head, and then hits him in the head a number of other times throughout the fight before he submits him. Meaning it's a radically different sport than Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Right? When you factor in all these other things that are not Brazilian jiu-jitsu, then, well, we understand <laughs> It's a different animal. And that's the same thing with this, uh, this situation you're describing of the guy, the MMA fighter using an Aikido move. I, I, use, I use moves like this all the time while sparring with my students and it blows their minds. But, you know, it's, it's not like how it is taught in Aikido. How it's taught in Aikido is, you know, the guy comes in, extends his arm, you grab that wrist from that cooperative opponent because there's no sparring in Aikido. Um, and then it just happens, right? But in a fight, what, what happens? People clinch and they throw punches and they fight and they knee each other to death. And then the guy who is more badly beaten is more prone to submit. Th this is how fights usually happen. This is how submissions usually happen in MMA. The guy gets beaten up first and then he gets submitted. It's very difficult to, to submit a fresh fighter. It's very difficult. When, when both guys are evenly matched, it's very difficult to submit a fresh fighter. And so when we see like a first round submission in the UFC, this, this is a really impressive feat to pull off. Um, generally, most of the submissions happen in the second and the third round because that's, that's after the guy has taken punishment, after he's tired, after he's demoralized, after he's already looking for a way out of the fight, when he's much more willing to give up that arm or stick his neck out a little bit, right? Because in the first round, you know, when everybody's fresh, when everybody is is intact and they're not beaten to a pulp yet, right? They're not going to give up those opportunities. They're not going to give up the wrist, if you will. But again, if you have a guy in the clinch and you are dominating the clinch and you are kneeing him to the point where he is feeling the bad intentions and he wants a way out of that cage, and you know, he does, he's gonna start making mistakes, like leaving his hand out there open where you can wrist lock. Here, if you don't know, folks at home watching, if you want to learn how to defend a wrist lock, here's a very simple technique. It's called making a tight fist. <laughs> Seriously, making a tight fist, which is why it's even so much harder to uh, wrist lock somebody in MMA gloves with the, uh, the hands wrapped. So in one regard, what, uh, what this guy, uh, what, uh, what was his name again? Um, uh, something Wolfman. I think it might be Dan Wolfman, but uh, I'm not yeah, sure. Okay. But... This, this thing that Dan did, in one regard, it's more impressive because it's, it is harder to wrist lock somebody wearing MMA gloves. And then the other hand, from a, a pure Aikido perspective, less impressive because it's, it's not pure Aikido. It's a, it's a dirty, rotten cage fight, right? Mm. Yeah, you so... know, that, that makes me think of... Um... While we're on the subject of uh, self-defense moves, <laughs> yeah, eye gouging and 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 and, and uh, nut cracking, right? Or okay. kicking the nuts, kicking the grinds. The only time I ever pulled that off is uh, this was when I was. I'm not. I'm not proud of this, and I'm not going to go like into too much detail because I'm not sure if I should or not. But essentially, I got into a fight. Yeah. This dude was bigger than me, and uh, so my first reaction was, okay. Um, you know, so I start, I start, I give him an elbow to the face because I know he, he, he doesn't, he wants, he wants to go. 
So I, I always had this habit of being preemptive. So I would strike first. So I gave him an elbow to the face and then we started, but he's a big guy. He didn't go down. So we started exchanging blows. So I'm just like walking forward and punching him in the head. And he's there punching me in the head, in the, in the face too. And then at one point I was able to, uh, uh, I surprised him. I kicked him in the face. And after I kicked him in the face, he was still coming forward, but he was a little bit dazed. And that's when I, like, I had both thumbs in his eyeballs and then I, I pushed it in. I pushed it in, but then he moved. So like my, I know my left, my left thumb actually went inside the socket, but he was moving. And then he moved and my, my, my thumb ended up in his mouth. And then he tried to bite off my thumb and I ripped, I ripped my thumb out and I still have the scar until today right here. And then from there, he fell to his, he fell down on the ground. And uh, no, I think we were, we were, we ended up in a, in a, in a grappling scenario. And this is when I didn't know how to fight. All I had as a background back then was uh, there was no grappling. There was just my Taekwondo. That's why I managed to kick him in the face. And there was, um, uh, I wouldn't consider Kung Fu. I don't think Kung Fu helped me at all in, the, in that, in that, in that uh, situation. So I had my Taekwondo and I had a little bit of uh, some self-defense stuff that I did like um, along the way. So then anyways, we, after that eye gouge, like uh, with my two thumbs going in, well, I tried to, to get the two thumbs inside, but only the left one went inside and then he slipped out of it and it ended up in his mouth. He tried to bite my thumb off. I ripped it off. It was bleeding. I still had the scars. We end up in a grappling situation and then we end up falling on the floor. So then we're on the floor, but my head is near his crotch. So that's when I started punching his crotch. So those are the, the only two times that I ever pulled off the, uh, get, like, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, gouging somebody's eyes out. Yeah, I, didn't gouge, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't take out his eye, but you know, I yeah, shoved it in there and then I, 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 I grind strike them, but I didn't kick him in the grind. I was punching his grind cause I was already on the ground with my head, like next to his crutch. Well, so I'd like to tell you the rest of the story here. Psychologically to do that. Well, it was, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of a life and death, uh, situation. So yeah. that's why, like, and, um, and like, I'm not going to tell you the end of the story on camera because I, I might, uh, I'm not sure if it would get me in trouble or not. But suffice uh, to say okay. that I was actually fighting two guys. So that, so while I was beating up on the bigger guy, the smaller guy was smashing bottles on my head. So Ooh. I, I think I must have gotten two, three bottles on my head while I was, uh, while, I, while I was attacking the bigger dude. But all that to say that, like, I literally had to, like punch the elbow the guy in the face, punch him a couple of times, kick him in the face, and then I was able to actually get my 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 thumbs like near his eyes. Basically, just oh, just to get to the uh, the dirty moves, you had to you had to fight just to get to that position. Yeah, what, and and I got like two free bottles of beer, like or or whatever the hell it was, smashed on my head. Yeah. And then I finally, all that, and then we finally fell to the ground, and that's when I was able to get, like, a couple of strikes into his grind. That, that is so interesting because, um, well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, do you remember when Keith Hackney fought Joe Son in the early UFC when there were no rules and groin strikes were still allowed? Like, oh, the, the yeah, yeah. deliberate groin strike I remember seeing in those early UFC days where, where it was still allowed was on the ground. Um, they were tied up. It was like um, almost like a weird, unintentional half guard type of position. And Keith Hackney starts punching Joe Son in the groin like three or four times, and and you could still see like reluctance in his face, like like he wasn't he wasn't enjoying it. He was like, uh, if I have to, I have to, you know. But it was only because he was kind of in that desperate situation. And it's so interesting that like. Nobody else did it, and I don't think it's because uh, nobody else thought about it. And I'm sure everybody thought about it. Anything goes. The first thing we think about is groin strikes and eye pokes, right? But it's a fight to get into that position. I, I, I've had a few students who were Aikido black belts over the years, and, and one of them, interesting little dude from Greece named Manolis. And uh, Manolis, he, he comes into the class, he trains for a few months, and um, after a few months of sparring, he actually managed just to pull off one of those flippy dippy 
Aikido throws on somebody while sparring, like MMA sparring. And afterwards I say, wow, that's, that's really cool. I've never seen anybody do one of those Aikido style flippy dippy throws in real life. And he said, yeah, that's, that's the reason I'm taking this class is to learn how to fight. So that, because Aikido only works when you already know how to fight. I thought, well, that's so interesting. Um, and what essentially what you're saying is dirty moves only know when you already know, or the dirty, the dirty moves only work when you already know how to fight. And I think that that's absolutely true. If, um, if you don't know anything about position, how are you going to get in position to poke someone in the eye? If you don't know anything about uh, position, how are you going to get in position to groin strike or any of these other dirty moves, if you will? And a lot of people say, well, I would just, I would just drop a 12 to 6 elbow on his back. Okay, how are you going to get to his back if you don't know how to fight? Right? Position first, then attack. The old uh, Pedro Sauer adage, man, it's, it's true in jiu-jitsu, it's true in self-defense, it's true in all aspects of combat. But see, that's the thing too, and uh, that was actually one of my uh, one of one of my next videos for 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 my channel is uh, is talking about like uh, you know self defense moves specifically the the um, you know the eye gouging and the the uh, the grind strikes like those things only work if you actually know how to fight like you said so you have to be able to um, um, <clears throat> well to set it up. That's or if the hard you totally part. surprise someone, or if you overwhelm them with uh, with strength, just like the wrist lock, it's like the the same strategy as the wrist lock, or really any of those Aikido moves, right? You got to yeah, know so how to fight, for <laughs> or, or take people by surprise, or, or just be physically imposing. Yeah, or so some say, combination of those three. So, so it's practically like you have to be already dumb, beating them to a pulp, before you could actually use those those self defense moves. But then at that point, it's not even self-defense anymore. It's just, well, then just learn how to fight. And, and those things actually take care of itself. Like, it's very easy for me to, like, if I was getting into a so-called altercation, a street fight, so to speak, like, it's not the first thing I'm going to be thinking about. Like, I, like uh, you know, uh, eye gouging and kicking his nuts. I'm going to be like, okay, how am I going to, like, essentially knock this guy out or throw him on his head? And once I do that, I will decide from there, like from there, I could decide to do all the nasty stuff, all the so-called, uh, you know, I could, I could rip off his ear if I want. I could, you know, I could, uh, I could poke his eyes, eyeballs out, you know, I could, I could, I could bite him or whatever, or I could smash his nuts to pieces, you know, or I could snap oh, yeah. his neck, you know, like, you know, the whole neck snapping thing. Yeah. But you get, so essentially you got to beat the crap out of the guy first. And then after that, you could essentially, uh, self-defense move and, but then you're, you're essentially like permanently injuring the guy or killing him. And uh, that's, not, no, that's no longer self-defense. So for me, yeah. self-defense is kind of like a, a, funny, uh, a funny way of thinking about it. It's like there is no such thing as self-defense. It's just, to me, I feel as though it's either you know how to fight or you don't. Like self-defense moves. Here's, here's a question of... for you. Sorry to interrupt, but um, I got to ask you this. Do you think you could beat a house cat in a fight? A house cat? Yeah. Like if that house cat was just went wild and feral and, and um and had bad intentions toward you, do you think you could beat that house cat in a fight? Oh man, that's a scary thought. Like not without taking a lot of not not without taking damage. Yeah. So yesterday Gary Tonin proposed this question on, on Instagram and it, I thought it was so fascinating, especially the responses. And that same day, my, my friend Nils, also known as Captain Krav Maga, on my YouTube channel, sent me a, a list of um, animals that people, like a study people, I'm stuttering a lot today. There was a, a study some scientists did, apparently they had a lot of downtime, what animals most people <laughs> believe that they could beat in a fight, right? And house cat was kind of at the bottom. But Gary Tonin is proposing this idea that nine times out of ten, the average guy would lose a fight to a wild house cat. And so I start reading the comments, and everyone's like, no, Gary, you're, you're wrong. House cats are wimpy. I'm, I'm a big, strong man. And Gary says, all right, how do you beat that cat? And the guys spell out, like, oh, I would just grab it and, and smash it or wring its neck or something. And Gary asks, like, okay, 
how how are you going to grab the cat? And and these guys, it gives them some pause. And I start thinking about this. Well, cats are incredibly fast, especially over short distances. House cats are way faster than humans. And if you try to catch a cat that doesn't want to be caught, that's a very difficult thing. Man, I had a bunch of pet cats when I was a kid. And um, it was my job. My mother would always uh, task me with the arduous task of throwing all the cats outside from time to time. And man, catching those things when they don't want to be caught is difficult. And if they want to fight you, if they stick out their claws and their teeth, as well as, you know, just running away from you and hiding and, and, uh, and becoming difficult to catch, that becomes, that just compounds the problem. And I started thinking about this more and more. Okay, so you have an animal as small as a 12 pound house cat that has these claws and these teeth and this, this superhuman agility uh, that's far beyond what, what any, any human can have. And they can, they can jump like, 10 feet in the air very quickly. And uh, if, if they don't want you to catch them, you won't catch them. If they don't want you to touch them, you won't touch them. So why am I bringing this up? It's, it's very similar to the subject we're just talking about. Like uh, if you want to use the dirty moves, you have to be able to actually get to the other guy first. You've got to be able to touch him, right? You've got to be able to control them. And the same thing with the cat. It's easy to imagine controlling a docile, friendly cat that sits on your lap and purrs, right? But if you've ever had an experience with a feral cat that doesn't like you, and uh, maybe a rabid animal that wants to scratch and bite you, um, you quickly learn that winning a fight isn't about killing the other person. It's about being the one who, who forces the other one to back down and submit. And if this, this wild animal can, um, you know, rapid fire machine gun claw you and then get in and out very quickly to the point where you decide it's not worth it anymore, it has just won that fight. You know, that's, that's deep. That's deep. Because, you know, I, I, my first thought is that, okay, I would have to wait until the cat jumps on me and attacks me. I'd have to grab, and, and then it, it would jump on me, it would probably catch me in the face, and I would yank it off, hold it super tight, and then from there I would, like, make, I guess, you know, either try to snap its neck or, or, or um, you know, like, or smash it against the wall. But, I mean, yeah, yeah. like, if, if a cat... Kita is officially your enemy now, my friend. <laughs> the what? Pita is, is now against you, my friend. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you said the internet, because, and then I just thought of uh, you know there was a there was a Netflix special, a uh, Netflix Netflix series. It was called "Don't F with Cats." Yeah, oh, and it was regarding. Yeah, you never heard of it? No, I haven't. Okay, it's regarding this serial killer uh, in in Montreal. Actually, this is where um, he 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 did a lot of murdering and all that. I think he murdered like a couple of people. But, anyways, essentially what he did is that he got attention. From people by torturing cats and he was filming it and he posted it on the internet and because of that he got um he he, he got his so-called claim to fame because he was you know obviously a psychopath serial killer so he wanted to be caught he wanted to be known and his way about it was uh you know torturing cats that's how he started oh, out man. he, he was posting videos periodically yeah of uh don't watch it it's it's a, it's a terrible like it's just yeah. not a good thing to put in your psyche you know like watching like 10 episodes of this crap? Nah, don't do it. But uh, all that to say that when you said, um, that's what I thought you said. I, I thought you said that like, oh, now the internet is, is, is your enemy because- No, PETA, the, just... people, the people for the ethical treatment of animals. Oh, okay, yeah, but this is like, you know, uh, you know just- It's hypothetical, I, I know. Hypothetical. Just, <laughs> just joking. Um, man. But yeah, man. I mean, think about it like, um, Think about a lion for a minute, you know, the lion, the king of the jungle. Not really. They, they live in the savanna. They live in open grasslands, not the jungle. Um, but why do we even say lions are the king of the jungle? Anyway, what do lions eat? We think of lions eating zebras and gazelles, and yeah, they do. But when they can't find one, what do they eat? Because lions often spend long periods of time without having anything to eat, and they, they walk around in like a near starvation state a lot, especially mm -hmm. the lions who live solo without the pride as, as a support system. So the solo lions, they can't take down a big animal by themselves. And so what they end up eating a lot of the times is a porcupine, those African porcupines. 
And this is really interesting, especially if you watch a video of lions hunting porcupines, because it is like their last resort. And the lion, before it hunts the porcupine, it stares at it for about 30 minutes. It just sits there and stares, thinking, how hungry am I again? Do I really want to do this? Oh, this is going to hurt. This is going to suck. And you see this look on the lion's face of, I don't want to do this, but I have no other options. I am so hungry. I have to do it. And then whether, and sometimes the lions lose. Sometimes they lose that fight against the porcupine. They, they run in there, they try to bite it, they get a face full of quills, and they're like, screw this, I'm done, I've had enough. And the porcupine wins a lot of the time. But even when the lion wins and eats the porcupine, it gets that same punishment. It, it gets a face full of quills. It's in pain for months afterward. It's scarred for life. And this is, this is such a fascinating analogy for, for fighters, I think. I always uh, use this as an analogy when people tell me, like, yeah, I want to be a fighter. I'm like, do you really, though? How hungry are you? You know? Are you as hungry as a lion that hasn't eaten in a month, staring at a porcupine, trying to decide whether or not it wants to, it wants to chase that meal? I don't know. How hungry are you? But, um, yeah, man. Winning a fight, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's about more than, more than just uh, beating the other guy into a pulp. But you know, all, all this talk, yeah. all this talk about like self-defense and like winning fights. You know, these people are always asking like, what's the best best martial art for self-defense and all that. I feel as though, like when you ask that question, because I I used to be like this too, like think like run these scenarios in my head what would i do if i get into an altercation i would do this i would do that but me like i was actually in like in like street gangs in in my uh in my late teens and after that i was uh uh yeah in my late teens actually i was i was in i was in gangs and i was actually fighting a lot in bars but it was always brawls it wasn't like it was like 10 on 5 or 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 5 on 1 or you know crazy stuff like that or you know just like all out like chaos everybody's just smashing bottles and throwing chairs around type of stuff right so yeah but all that to say that like and, and then from throughout my 20s and even up until um for, for the longest time i've always had this oh you know self-defense mentality where oh if this would happen i would do this i would do that and blah, blah, blah. but the truth is like how often are you planning on getting into street fights <laughs> good and, question and, and, and here's the thing, like, where are you hanging out to always be getting into fights? Are you hanging out in, in bars? Is that what you're doing? You're drinking and then you're, you're getting drunk and you're picking fights with people and you're just waiting for it to happen? Or, or are you in a neighborhood that's so bad that you're essentially, um, you know, getting, getting robbed or getting, you know, like, like that, that's why this mentality, I think that. It, it, it might stem from people being bullied, so they need to, they want to train something to, to get that self-confidence in case something happens. But the truth is, how often is it really going to happen, if it's even going to happen in your lifetime? Yeah. And, and it, I'm not saying this so that people don't actually go out and train. They should, because the truth is, if you spend all your time training, guess what? You're not partying in bars. You're not hanging around at after hours. You're not yeah. there you know, doing like, uh, uh, doing, um, you know, dirty business that might, uh, get you implicated in these kind of, uh, stories, you know, so exactly. and you're developing moral character that helps you become the type of person that people don't want to beat up. Not yeah. because you're big and scary, but because you're, you develop social skills and you're able to interact in a positive way with people. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So, so that's why I like these, it's not that I, Sometimes I, I get, uh, I find it funny that I get tired of, of seeing the same questions because I'm like, do you live in some kind of war zone, some kind of ghetto where like, you know, people are know. literally dying. Like every day you're seeing like two, three people getting, getting killed in the street. There's fights happening everywhere. Like, is that what it is? You know, like what's big, you know, this big obsession with, uh, you know, self-defense. Yeah. And I think that, that people just kind of um, let their imagination go wild a little bit, right? Because they get bullied yeah. and they feel that, oh, next time I don't want, ever want this to happen to me anymore. And then they start watching videos on YouTube on, on self-defense and this and that. And they just go a little bit uh, 
off the rails and and it's just uh in their imagination that they're that it's actually happening but it's actually yeah. not happening if that makes any sense yeah i mean that makes perfect sense you know I, I actually have seen people killed in the street in front of me like um i spent a couple of years in argentina um in the uh they call them vicious de miseria um that means village of misery they're like <laughs> basically ghettos just ghettos made out of garbage um very high crime rates. I was I was there in the '90s, like right before the the economic collapse. Um, back in 2000, I was there from like '97 to '99. Anyway, so I actually saw people get killed in front of me. I saw people shot in the street. I saw uh, horrible acts of violence. But at the same time, do you know how many street fights I got into in Argentina? Zero. Do you know how many street fights I've got into as an adult? Zero. Do you know how, how many street fights I anticipate getting into in my life? Zero. And why is that? It's not because violence doesn't exist. It do, it's not because violent people aren't out there. It's not because people don't get killed in the streets. It's because I choose not to participate in that. And I know when I say things like that, people are like, oh, well, well I don't have that option, you know? Violence follows me around. I, uh, I, you know, if if you get in a couple of street fights in your life, all right, that's understandable. Sometimes violence is unavoidable. Sometimes, but if you've been in a lot of street fights, it's because you're the jerk starting those fights. Man, do you ever see those those ads? I don't know if they they still pop up, but for the longest time, every like martial arts themed channel got this ad from this. This dude with this fake name, John Black, he's like, let me teach you my secret street fighting system that will allow you to win a fight as easily as sneezing in just like two easy lessons. And it has nothing to do with MMA or boxing or whatever. And it, it was the stupidest ad. It was from this. Uh, uh, anyway, it, it, it was all fake, basically. If you actually bought the program and looked at it, it was, it's just the same basic self-defense nonsense everybody teaches. But... This guy claimed to have forced himself to get into 600 street fights in order to learn how to fight, to develop this, this unquestionable system of, uh, of self-defense. And I was like, okay, if you get into 600 street fights, you are the problem. You are the problem, not the other guys. <laughs> you are the people, I mean, you are the one that people are afraid of. You are the, you are the one that people worry about. You are the boogeyman, basically. Don't be that guy. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like you, you made a really good point there. Like I think that, um, in regards to, like, if you're always getting into fights, it's because you're you're essentially the problem. And so I believe in. Now that I think about it, I believe in learning how to fight, with the intention of always avoiding the fight. Yeah. At all costs because it's just not worth it. You know, yes, so it's better to be a warrior in a garden than, in, than a gardener in a, in a battlefield. I don't know True. if you ever heard that term, right? Yes. So, so the whole point of learning to fight is really a question of uh, self-mastery and self-discipline, and it's actually to avoid the fight. It's not to get into the fight, yeah. if that makes any sense. And I think that's that a better approach. So, yeah. yeah. That so, makes perfect sense. So for all the all all the self defense guys, the martial art guys who are worried about self defense, like don't think about fighting. Learn how to fight and then just avoid it at all costs. If ever yeah. it happens, well, you'll have the tools and the skill set, you know. But chances are, if you spend a lot of time training, like like you do, like I do, like a lot of guys who are or you know, um, really heavy into combat sports, you're not gonna have the time to fight, and you're not gonna you know like because you're you you'll be too busy training. And, and then you'll be, you know, living your life and doing good things as opposed to hanging out, hanging around in bars or hanging around with criminals or whatever, you know, uh, and then getting into that kind of trouble. Listen, Hong, how, how many people die every year from bad guys jumping out of the shadows? It happens, but it's not a huge number. All right, now let's contrast that number. How many people die every year of heart disease and stroke? Huge. That's the number one killer of humans on planet Earth. 
what is the biggest preventative measure you can take against heart disease and stroke? Stay fit. <laughs> yes. Exercise. Ex exercise. Yes. Okay. What do you do when you get out there and train in martial arts? You're exercising. That is the best self-defense there is. I hate the self-defense industry because they're pointing their fingers in the wrong direction at the wrong enemy. They're pointing their fingers at the imaginary boogeyman or at, hiding in the shadows, right? The imaginary ninjas that, are, that will jump out on the streets and punch you in the groin. Most of the time that doesn't happen. The way most people are probably going to die is heart failure or a stroke. Car, car accident. And yeah, car accidents are up there too, man. Cancer, all, all of these things that, that um, they're not glorious, they're not... They're not um, romanticized it's just uh they're boring ways to die if you will if there if there is such a thing as a boring way to die um but the best measures to prevent those things fitness exercise you know these basic basic things we we talked about at the beginning we we spent a lot of time talking about like man you look so young you look young we're not young we're just fit right are we prime candidates for heart disease? Well, I certainly hope not, not according to statistics. Why? Because we exercise. Uh, why do we exercise? Well, because we're martial artists, right? It's what martial artists do. But um, ultimately, the prime enemy that we're fighting, that we're defending ourselves from, is that heart disease and stroke and other lifestyle-related illnesses by not having that lifestyle that is conducive to those diseases. So, now nothing makes you invincible. The, the end goal isn't live forever because that's impossible. But man, if, if you can have a life like uh, my 80 year old friend that I sparred in Jiangsu province back in the day, if he's still alive today, he would be 92. I don't know if he is, but if you, have, if you can have a life like him, where you can do backflips at the age of 80. Imagine that man's quality of life. I imagine that for a minute. If you had that type of mobility and strength all the days of your life and you never had to worry about, oh man, what if I end up in, in an old folks home attached to a ventilator or something like that? Yeah, man, yeah. That, that's peace of mind. That is real peace of mind. But that man is impressive because the thing is, it's not just the feats that he did, right, in terms of the backflip and the way he was able to fight. I mean, it's just for him to be able to have kept that up all that time, what kind of mindset he must have had, you know? In my opinion, a quality mindset, you know, a very positive and good mindset for his, for his own life because he had, to, he, had to, he had to see life in a way where he had to stay young mentally and open and always learning and always progressing to be able to maintain that skill level well to increase that skill level and to maintain that physicality and and those things that he was able to do with his body so yeah. i think i think a big part of what he did was really impressive in terms of uh like the mental game the mental aspect that had that that drove all his behavior so that he was still able to to get to that point at 80 and do what he did and on another note like in terms of so essentially, the self-defense industry is, is a made-up industry. They're yes. just making up a boogeyman and then trying to sell you a solution. It, it, it is a, uh, a cure looking for a disease, is what that is. And it, it is the opposite of, uh, of how um, you know, medicine or science or, or any scholarly field is supposed to work. It, it, is a dis it is a cure looking for a disease, man. Nothing else. I, I hate the self-defense industry. I absolutely hate it. A lot of people are confused by that because they, they say, don't, aren't you a, are, aren't you a self-defense instructor? The answer is no, no. I'm a, a, a mixed martial arts coach. I, I teach fighters how to win fights, self-defense. Like, you know, it's the opposite of that. Real self-defense, as far as if you do have, uh, if you are conf confronted with danger on the streets or whatever, real self-defense is remove yourself from the danger, right? I mean, think, think about our, our base human instincts for self-preservation. If, if there is a threat coming at you, we generally respond one of four ways. The primary one is we, we tend to freeze, 
Nobody ever talks about that. Well, few people do. But we tend to freeze, hoping that the danger will just go away. And sometimes it does, because if you, if you make sudden movements around certain dangerous animals, they'll jump on you. If you don't move, a lot of them will just kind of look at you and sniff you and walk on. Right. So that, that actually is a, there is an evolutionary advantage to freezing, giving yourself pause to assess the situation. Basically, don't do anything stupid. Okay. But then if something's lunging at us and lurching at us right away, our instincts are basically three things. Either one, try to run away from the danger, get away, move ourselves as far away from that danger as possible. Right? It's not good for winning fights, but it is good for self-preservation. The second thing is try to push the danger away from you. And the third thing is grab that danger as tightly as you can and hold it as tightly as you can so it can't move and hurt you. So those are the three three instincts we have as far as being untrained. And you'll see this you'll see this a lot in uh, in street fights as well. Um, you know, how many street fights go like this? It all it always starts with escalation. Two guys get mad at each other. It escalates. They push each other. It could have stopped at any point before it got to this before it even got to the push. If somebody just said, hey man, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, let me get out of your way. I think most people would be, wow, I like this guy. I don't wanna fight him, I wanna be his friend. Because how many people get told, I'm wrong, you're right in their life? Most people never have that experience. Most people go through their lives feeling disrespected all the time. And so if somebody, man, I remember one of my students, um, a few years back, there, there was this, uh, this young woman taking my class, and uh, I remember I was wrong about something. And I, I, I told her, I, I'm, I'm wrong, and you're right. And I, I apologized, and her eyes lit up. She was like, say that again, please. I've <laughs> never heard those words before in my life before. <laughs> and she was, she was like taken aback. I was like, I'm wrong, and you're right in this situation, and I apologize. And she was like, wow. And... Those words commanded so much respect from her from that moment on. And um, like, if, if you want to command respect, you have to show respect. And that's, that's one of these, one of these uh, street lessons people need to, need to know. I have a friend, uh, my friend Angelo, I did a podcast with him. He lives in Japan, but he grew up in, in Southern California and he had, he had uh, bunch of run-ins with with gangs back in the day and he told me something very interesting which is that on the streets gangs operate in the currency of respect and it's not so much about who can beat up who but who shows respect to whom and that's very very interesting and how um in order to essentially get out of situations that would have otherwise got him killed by showing a certain level of respect to certain people he was able to survive. Um, and we can carry that, that same thing, not just in the streets, but in everyday life, like show people respect in order to get that respect so that the fight never happens. But when it does happen, what happens? They push, right? They're trying to push each other, keep that danger as far away from you as possible. And then they, they throw their awkward haymakers. And then what do they do? Uh, they latch onto each other in a schoolyard bully headlock. They hold each, they hold the danger as close as possible, tumble on the ground, and hope their friends break them apart, giving them a face-saving exit so they can leave with a uh, semblance of respect in their lives. Because at the end of the day, that's all they want is, is feeling respected. And when people are calling each other out on the internet, I'm better than you, I'm a better fighter than you. All they want is a piece of respect. All they want is somebody saying, hey, you matter too. You're a, you're a real person just like me. Um, anyway, that got, got a little preachy, but my camera's about to run out of battery. So, <laughs> any, any other questions or topics you would like to address before we wrap up this podcast, my friend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, well, first off, I want to say, like, thank you very much for, you know, taking the time to, you know, to have me on your podcast. Uh, it, it was great, honestly, first time. And, you know, I got it. I got a podcast with, uh, with somebody that I, I do. I enjoy watching a lot and that I respect a lot. So thank you very much for that. Um, you know, uh, so I got a last question for you. Um, 
what's your take on 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 gym uh, clean, cleanliness? Like how gym much? Oh, super yeah, important, yeah. man. That's that's like one. So you were asking me earlier, like, what should a fighter look for in a gym? Number one, cleanliness, because man, here's a precautionary tale. If you want to be grossed out and uh, and have PTSD, Google Kevin Randleman staph infection. The late great Kevin Randleman got a staph infection on his side that opened up a giant, you know, it's flesh eating bacteria, and it starts out small, like little red bumps or something like that, and it can kill you, and it has killed people. And and Kevin Randleman, like you can see the inside of his abdominal cavity from that. It's gross, man. So. That just starts with the bacteria. Staphylococcus, it grows in the human nasal cavity. In here, it's harmless, but out there, when it gets into a, an open wound or a scratch or a scrape or something like that, which, which is really common when you're training and you don't clean that off afterward, it, it can cause a, a horrible infection. That, that's just one little thing. Then you got annoying things like ring, ringworm and other funguses. <sighs> Dirty germs can kill you, man. They can kill you. It's not just unpleasant, it's not just gross, it's not just smelly, they can actually kill you. So, the best coaches that I know, the best coaches, right? They're, they're not the guys who get the most attention, they're not the guys who train the best fighters, they're the guys who mop the mats themselves. Not because they can't afford to get somebody else to do it, but because they wanna make sure that they are clean, they wanna make sure that everybody is safe. They ensure the safety of they're fighters above all else. And if your gym is not clean, that means they do not care about your safety and well-being. I mean, that is one of the most important things. So, yeah, look for, make sure they clean and disinfect the mats first thing in the morning and after, after training is done. Or, best case scenario, after every training session, if you can mop those mats and disinfect them after every training session, that's ideal. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Also, yeah. wash your belts. I know a lot of martial artists don't do this, and they think belts are magical. It's part of the uniform. You're going to sweat on that thing. You're going to get bacteria on it. I don't know if, if, if you're one of those guys who doesn't wash your belt, but if not, repent of your wicked ways and wash your belt. It's part of your uniform. You wouldn't just not wash your rash guard or not wash your gi or wash your gym shorts, right? Why would you not wash your belt? Wash that too. Wash that too. I'm you know, the only, <laughs> the only reason why I didn't, I stopped washing my belts because when, when I got my first yellow belt in judo, I washed it so much, it turned, turned white. <laughs> <laughs> so then my coaches were like, you're a dumbass. You shouldn't wash your belt. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Doesn't it get sweat on it? He's, they're like, no, it doesn't get sweat on it. Like you, you wear of it like on it the outside. <laughs> Of course. Now, if if, if 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 you're worried about that, there are other ways to wash your belt. Like you, you know, you can you can soak it in like in a disinfectant solution and just hang out to dry. You don't have to stick it in a in a like a machine washer dryer thing that can that can potentially damage or discolor it. Right? Make sure that thing's clean. There are, there are very simple solutions to clean a belt without damaging it. Okay, gotcha. No, I'll, I'll, I I repent. And I will wash my belt because now that I understand the importance of it and that sweat actually does get into it, which I kind of knew, but I kind of decided I, I wanted to believe that I could get away with it. I mean, yeah, but, uh, think about it. Right now, we're living in a world where so many people in so many countries are running around with, with masks and, and terrified of, of uh, you know, invisible germs in, in, in the air all around us that can kill mm -hmm. us. And they're still not washing their belts. And I'm like, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I'm a moron. Like, uh, yeah. So, it's okay. I, I don't. I don't pretend to be a smart guy. Uh, I probably. I probably look smarter than I actually am because maybe people look at me and I'm Asian and they're like, "Oh yeah, you must. You must be good at math or something." But I actually not very good at. <laughs> oh, but man. um, so listen. Uh, thank you very much for your time, man. We've been going on You're for like four hours now. This it's one of the longest podcasts I've done. Not the yeah. longest, though. Not the longest. Not really. But I, I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed talking to you, my friend. All right. Okay. Yeah, me Thank too. Thank you so much. All right. Shout out once again. Um, 
to OG Fitness, please go check out his channel. We'll put links in the description down below. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train. Thank you, sir.